Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 15th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Uh, can I welcome members, can welcome our panel of witnesses, who I'll introduce in a second, and welcome uh, visitors joining us in the gallery. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off, or at least turn to silent, all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the committee's work. We have uh, apologies this morning from uh, Chick Brody, who's running late, but hopes to be with us uh, shortly. Uh, item uh, one on the agenda, we are continuing our inquiry into security of supply. Um, and I'd like to welcome our first panel uh, of witnesses, starting on my left. We have uh, Marco Giuli, uh, who is policy analyst at the European Policy Centre. Uh, Gina Hanrahan, who is climate and energy policy officer at WWF Scotland. Uh, Dr Neil Wade, who is senior research associate at the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, Newcastle University and Malcolm Kay, who is Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. So, welcome to you all and thank you for coming along this morning. Now, we have about uh, 75 minutes for this panel because we do have quite a busy uh, schedule this morning. Um, I've asked members if they would to keep their questions short uh, and to the point and if we could have answers that are as short and to the point. <laughs> that would be very helpful in getting through the, the points we want to cover in the time available. And I've asked uh, members if they would initially uh, address their questions to one particular panel member. Um, and then uh, uh, if you want to uh, come in on a, on a point that's been made by another panellist, if you just catch my eye, I'll bring you in uh, as best I can as time allows, given we do have quite a lot of ground uh, to cover. Um, I wonder if I could maybe start off and address the question initially to, to Gina Hanrahan about the WWF uh, report, Pathways to Power, which we've, which we've seen and, and, and has been circulated. It has come up, as I think you know, in previous discussions. W when we took evidence on uh, this um, two weeks ago, uh, we did hear from a number of uh, experts in the field, including a number of academics, who were, I think it's fair to say, quite sceptical about the idea that we could have a, a purely uh, renewable um, uh, renewable powered energy uh, capacity in Scotland by 2030 that, uh, based on uh, um, interconnection and storage to provide a backup and I think we heard similar evidence as well uh, last week. So I suppose my first question is you know, why does WWF believe that this is feasible when we've heard quite a number of sceptical voices questioning whether that's a, a practical way forward? Sure. Um, so the, the reason that we commissioned this research in the first place was because of concerns about the pace of CCS development on the one hand um, and also because of the commercial realities of thermal power here in Scotland and I think the, the committee has heard a, a lot of evidence over the last few weeks um, because of a variety of factors. It's very unlikely um, given market signals that new thermal plants will be built here in Scotland. So we wanted to see uh, in those circumstances whether it would be possible to go uh, close to 100% renewable. I should clarify that the report does build in uh, some uh, thermal power. There's still a little bit of CCS in the system, so we assume that, that, that the CCS plant, uh, demo plant at, at Peterhead goes ahead. And it also includes a little bit of biomass. Um, uh, so it's not just 100% wind. I think that's important to clarify. We commissioned an uh, independent uh, engineering consultancy, a world-leading engineering consultancy, DNVGL, to do the analysis for us. And they showed that uh, it is feasible uh, to uh, create a close to 100% renewable system by 2030 because we're moving from a situation uh, where traditionally security of supply was, was provided by baseload plants um, with uh, additional peaking plants to a much more flexible dynamic system, one where we concentrate on demand reduction, on uh, enhancing storage, enhancing transmission and interconnection. So they've demonstrated that that's absolutely feasible by 2030 and in fact desirable because it allows Scotland to play to its uh, renewable strengths as part of a GB grid. I did listen to the uh, the questions that were asked uh, of the uh, experts in the initial um, initial session and uh, I would ha have some concerns that the technical report perhaps wasn't uh, parsed in, in uh, full detail. So our report does deal with issues around uh, the operability of the system, which I think was one of the points that was raised, uh, system stability, whether the system would function dynamically. It considers issues like inertia, voltage control uh, and black start and DNVGL are confident that those issues can be managed. 
Um, National Grid uh, have a system operability framework which deals with how they are trying to address the challenges of moving to a low carbon system and I think maybe that's something the committee might like to pick up with them in the session um, this, uh, later this morning. Um, so uh, I think that uh, certainly there are challenges in managing a low carbon, very high renewable system, but we uh, are slowly but surely developing the tools to do so. Um, the other uh, concern that was raised was that the uh, report doesn't account for um, the interactions with heating and transport. The report does deal with the interactions with heating and transport. It looks at how uh, a shift to more electrification of heating will impact on the network. Um, and it shows that uh, it, it also looks at the, uh, the impact of electrification of transport. And the findings of the report show that essentially uh, the electrification of transport will add additional load, but that will be offset to a large extent by the shift um, from resistive heating to electric heat pumps in the heat sector. I should say that WWF is also uh, commissioning um, a much broader analysis of uh, heat transport and electricity, how the energy system needs to function as a whole by 2030 to meet our climate change targets. That's being done for us by Ricardo AEA. The findings aren't available just yet, um, but we have some initial findings and it shows that we will need much higher proportions of renewable heat and transport in our system, as well as a huge proportion of renewable electricity. Okay, th thanks for that. Um, I'm quite keen to hear fr from other members of the panel on this, on this issue as to whether we, whether we should have um, a new thermal plant, whether we require a new thermal plant in Scotland or whether we can go purely to a renewable system. But I, I, one, before I do that, one follow-up, if, if I can. Um, because some of the evidence we heard suggested that if we went down that model you're proposing, what we would in effect be doing is relying on importing to Scotland through interconnectors uh, unabated uh, gas or coal produced power or nuclear power. Uh, and therefore, isn't it, isn't it a bit of a, of a cop out really for us to say we'll be, we'll be renewable, but when the wind isn't blowing, we'll be importing fossil fuel produced power or nuclear power from the rest of the UK or indeed further afield? I think we have to think about uh, the system as a whole. Where do the resource strengths lie and how do we play to resource strengths? So in Scotland, we have an amazing renewables resource and I think it would be perverse for us to build a large amount of thermal plant here in Scotland, which would naturally limit the amount of, uh, of our renewables resource that we could send through the, the wires uh, on a regular basis. Um, and it would, if, if we were to build, uh, for instance, a, a conventional gas plant here in Scotland, it would have to function at a very, very low load factor. Um, if it's to avoid breaching the decarbonisation target and to ensure that we can uh, use our, our renewable strengths. Um, otherwise, we'd have to build a huge amount of transmission capacity um, to accommodate both thermal power and renewables in Scotland. Uh, and I don't know whether that's in the, the economic interests of consumers as a whole. So I, I, I understand the, uh, the slight hesitation about it, but... Um, you know, we can't build an infinite amount of transmission capacity. So what do we choose to send through the wires and how does the system function best as a whole? Okay, but, but you accept the basic point though that we, could, we, could, we would still be relying on imports of power from elsewhere, Absolutely. which might well be produced in a, in a, in a high carbon fashion. Absolutely, I uh, accept the, the principle that uh, uh, there will be imports on certain days of the year when there is uh, low renewables capacity in Scotland. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that the, uh, the GB, GB grid is expected to uh, decarbonise at roughly the same rate as our grid here in Scotland. The Committee on Climate Change has recommended um, that uh, the UK government sets a decarbonisation target for 2030 of 50, gra 50 to 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. The Scottish government has already set that target based on the CCC advice. I think that's welcome. It clearly acknowledges that decarbonising electricity is the first step to wider uh, system-wide decarbonisation. Yeah, absolutely right. But of course, you'll appreciate that uh, due to a policy difference, the UK government might take the view that the way to achieve that target is through new nuclear power, which is not something that might be pursued in Scotland. I, I accept that, yes. Okay, thanks. I'm keen to bring in some others. Mr. Mr. Kay, I think you were trying to come in. Uh, yes. Um, as Gina said, it's, I think, worth looking at the underlying technical report, which I've got no quarrel with at all, but it's also worth stressing that what the technical report makes clear is that security can be maintained on the assumptions in the report, 
Um, and if you make the assumptions in the report, it points out that security would be maintained whatever the system in Scotland is, even if there were no generation in Scotland. So it's, it's not really saying very much about what the optimum uh, system is either in Scotland or in the UK, um, and that's a much wider question. Um, th that said, I mean, the, the, the basic challenge is certainly there, and I think that the um, uh, report is right to, to point up this challenge. What I think is um, missing from the report, in a sense, though it wasn't asked to look at this, is how, how you give the right sort of economic signals, how you construct markets um, in a way which might deliver this. The, the, the underlying sort of assumption in the report, I think, and the underlying assumption, I think, in some of the witnesses you um, spoken to so far is that the government has to sit down and decide what the system looks like. Um, now, we're supposed to be living in a liberalised system. We're supposed to be finding some sort of way in which the market can signal that, um, even within uh, an environmental framework. And I think that, I in many ways, is the key challenge. Okay, thanks. We're going to come on, I think, later in the session to, to explore some of these issues around the market signals. Dr. Wade, do you want to come in? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I think I just emphasize the interconnectedness of um, systems within Scotland, so the electricity and the heat system, and how they're going to need to become more interconnected and interdependent um, in, in the future, and also the interconnectedness with the rest of the GB system. Um, your, your, your questions about how the uh, balance of energy supply is made up, whether, whether that is appropriate for it to come from the rest of the GB system. I, I, the, the most economic way to build a system is to include diversity, which is what the network provides. So, to I, I'm not I'm not sure of the the the, the, the of thinking of n trying to be completely isolated in in energy security is, is not really the approach I would follow. I, I think you need to make use of the resource that comes from from GB, um, and that may or may not be of a similar level of um, decarbonised energy that Scotland's able to produce. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Mr Gilly, do you have a particular view on this? Or? Um, I mean, I um, mainly agree with, uh, with the last point. I think there's um, no really, uh, there's no energy security that can be fully achieved in a completely insulated system. Basically, um, systems are made of a mix, but even uh, massively enlarging the role of renewables in this mix, um, security can be mainly achieved through interconnection because uh, renewables give their uh, um, best contribute to the system. Um, the more we enlarge the geographical scope or the geographical deployment of them, because like this, they can um, really exploit uh, um, exploit synergies. And the, um, the one of the big problems we had with renewables in in Europe has been a patchwork of uh, very different support schemes. Uh, this was completely uncoordinated. Uh, was it would have been probably much more efficient and secure. Uh, uh, to have a coordinated approach, for instance, insisting on uh, on wind in the north of Europe and on solar in the in southern Europe, and this hasn't happened, and this is the reason why uh, today we have uh, we have so many problems within the internal market. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring in um, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, convener, uh, and good morning. Um, perhaps I, I just with Marco um, explore the the sort of interconnection aspect with Europe. If if we're looking at the sort of GB aspect uh, at the moment and our capacity margins are sort of narrowing, is it not the same case that this is the same situation in Europe? So therefore, going ahead uh, with the, the interconnections with Europe, how does that actually secure the supply for GB? I mean, if other member states are actually having the same problem, especially in high demand times like winter. Mm -hmm. Marco. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the approach um, in Europe has been for a long time uh, the one to um, encourage interconnection, but with, um, with I would say, quite meager results. Uh, there has been a lot of advancement in terms of coupling. This has brought some uh, some results, and uh, coupling involved 
um, JB um, as well. Uh, unfortunately, there is here a problem of the original market design with the uh, internal energy market. Um, what I'm uh, referring to is that basically what um, Europe did was elaborating this uh, um, internal market at the time when renewables hadn't yet displayed their, um, let's say, disruptive um, effects on, um, on energy mix. Uh, so um, actually coupling alone uh, did not deliver. When Germany decided unilaterally to go for this uh, energy event, basically we had before that a uh, good convergence of prices uh, in the whole uh, central western Europe region when Germany went unilaterally for energy event uh, since um, 2000, uh, um, 2000, 2012, I would say, this, uh, this price convergence uh, um, was really reduced and this is very much related to a lack of interconnection. Uh, now, there is a new... Uh, political impetus to encourage interconnection, but there is also the um, the fear um, in the EU that this um, unilateral adoption of capacity mechanisms might put in jeopardy uh, this further um, efforts for integration and interconnection. Do you think um, it's feasible? to set up what has been proposed within the sort of regional aspect of having the operational centres, regional operation centres within Europe um, to uh, ensure that there's a, 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 a direct supply on demand. And the reason I'm asking is, is it feasible because obviously the pricing structure uh, within GB and maybe the rest of Europe isn't compatible. So therefore th there's going to be some <laughs> variation and that's probably it's not in the interest, perhaps, of the GB consumer, or indeed some of the European consumers. What would your is it feasible this regional uh, approach that is being proposed within Europe? Um, I think the the original uh, the, the original approach. The reason why uh, it was proposed is exactly because it was considered the, the most feasible uh, uh, approach. Of course, the something um, coming. Uh, let's say top down and propose a, a completely uniform uh, market design was an option that was uh, rejected and I think even the regional approach right now is uh, uh, is not in very in very good shape this uh, this is an approach that will be quite consistent with the world philosophy of the of the energy union but we also saw that in the um, uh, let's say council half endorsement of the of the um, energy union and the member states insisted on keeping a, a flexible market design and if we want to read this between the lines basically um, it means that uh, they're not very confident on on uh, a regional approach i'll bring another witness in yeah. a minute but i just want to explore one aspect of it that this, this aspect of the the sort of european union um the 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 differences in the approach to, for instance, or climate change targets uh, within GB, uh, well, Scotland, the rest of the GB and Europe is somewhat different. So therefore, um, the approach to actually supplying a energy is also very different. It's not compatible, is it? Uh, well, I mean, this uh, uh, very much refer to the whole um, European approach to uh, climate change. I cannot specifically comment on the uh, on the Scottish uh, on the Scottish case. We have now new um, targets for um, 2030, uh, but I think that the uh, approach will basically not change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doctor Wade, you're keen to come in. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, just wanted to you you asking about what. Um, benefit the interconnector provides for um, yeah. um, security of supply so how, can, how much can we depend on on those um, and I just wanted to make the point that in the in the capacity mechanism the interconnectors will be included in that from I think it's 2018-19 so at the moment the interconnectors aren't operated in a way that necessarily contributes to security of supply but they, they will be included in the capacity mechanism um, in the future how that pans out I can't say for sure okay um, Gina Hanran. 
just wanted to talk about the, the principle of how interconnectors can help to contribute to security of supply. Um, so uh, firstly, while peak demand might occur at, at similar times in, in, in markets that are close to us, uh, unplanned outages don't tend to. Um, so, you know, if you have a big piece of kit coming off the system because of seaweed or jellyfish or anything like that, um, you know, it's, it's unlikely that, it's, that the same thing is, is happening uh, at the same time in another country. Um, also, the more integrated and interconnected we are um, as, a, as an energy union uh, long term, um, the, the more we can benefit from the different energy choices that different countries have made. So, for instance, Norway has a lot of uh, storage pumped hydro, um, and that is a very natural complement in many ways to uh, high wind and, and, and other uh, sources of renewables, say, for instance, here in Scotland. So um, interconnection does have an important role to play, and it helps to keep the cost down overall of the energy transition. Um, and the, the final point, I, I suppose, to make on that is that at the moment, interconnection is considered very conservatively in uh, analyses of security of supply. Um, many uh, academics and others have argued that we, we could ac account for more interconnection um, as, as firm capacity for uh, meeting peak demand. We, we, we tend to be very conservative about it. Um, analysis by Poirie and Redpoint and a number of very respectable consultancies have shown the value of interconnection in terms of security okay. of supply. Okay. Um, Mr. King? You want to a say? small footnote on the interconnection point. Um, what, um, as a lot of what has been said applies to a large fully interconnected area like Europe. With an island, the situation is slightly different. The normal criterion for security in a city uh, system is what's called N minus one. You should be able to do without your largest single unit of supply. Now, in traditional systems, that's the power station. You think of a power station going out. In, for instance, the modeling that was done for the WWF report, the largest single item is the interconnector, or one or either of the interconnectors. So in a sense, you're replacing, <laughs> to a fair extent, one risk with another. There is a risk that that will not be available. Um, so it, it's a question of size when you come to iron supplies. In a fully interconnected system, that's not a problem. You've got a, a, a large excess of interconnection capacity, but that's not necessarily true of an island. Okay. Um, yes, okay. Yeah, I, I'm just uh, still trying to sort of um, see where or, uh, the, the, the actual security supply would be. Do, do you envisage that what we have, would we, would we be an exporter or would we be an importer in terms of the interconnection um, uh, given our situation? And, and my, I suppose my, my question relates to the fact that if other member states are at a time of high demand and uh, there's a better pricing structure, uh, in operation, surely then the electricity is going to flow to the other member states rather than to the GB. Would that not be the case? So if we're dependent upon that, um, others may have a better um, a pricing structure than we do, uh, and so therefore the electricity will flow if it's a operational uh, and more beneficial to companies uh, go to the member states that they make a higher profit. Um, I think that um, this issue of the um, uh, how many peak load hours are shared between member states needs to be based on some uh, um, on some rather technical assessment. Uh, what I can make a reference to is a, um, a study of the European Parliament Research Centre uh, that dates back to. Um, I think the end of 2013, and used this methodology to explore the um, the potential of. Uh, um, I mean, at the time was the potential of coupling, but uh, we know it's not enough. We need also some degree of um, physical interconnection to reach good um, results. And in the most of the cases, um, there were a lot of matches bilateral between countries and uh, bilateral between regions and between single countries within some, some particular region. And I mean, there, was a lot, there were a lot of discrepancies, but um, in, uh, in average terms, the, um, this uh, uh, share of peak load hours was below 40%, which um, induces to think about a good potential for, uh, for coupling. Uh, when, when 
we have to evaluate the performance, uh, the, the pictures um, is much more um, complex because in some cases uh, coupling gave a very um, very good results uh, is for instance the case between um, Spain and Portugal and uh, in some other cases basically price convergence uh, uh, just did not happen it stayed um, the, the price differentials stayed just the same it's for instance the case of France and Italy okay all right um, Gordon McDonald's got something. Just a very quick supplementary and it's um, for Gina um, on your pathways to power uh, report. Um, you, you've suggested that Scotland doesn't need any uh, large-scale generation that we can depend on wind power, etc. And there is the issue of the interconnectors. Uh, Professor Hazeldean and his written evidence said, on the, you know, on the basis of closure of large-scale uh, generation in Scotland, said the prospect would require to treble or more the present interconnection there will inevitably be technical problems related to frequency stability at 50 hertz and to maintaining equitable voltage dependent on peaks and troughs of wind output. So, you know, if we don't have the interconnection capacity to rely on imports from south of the border, if we didn't have um, large-scale generation in Scotland, and there are these other issues to do with stability of voltage, etc., how would we make up that shortfall? Um, so uh, I heard uh, Stuart Hazeldean's point about the, the need to triple interconnection. Certainly the analysis that DNVGL did based on our scenario uh, indicated that the amount of transmission capacity upgrades that were in the system in planning and long term uh, being discussed was more than adequate um, to deliver security of supply through the transmission network for those uh, occasions when, uh, for those relatively rare occasions when there is very, very little wind and other renewables on the system. Um, so uh, I don't think there's a need to uh, spend phenomenal amounts on transmission capacity as a whole. Uh, the pipeline that's there is, is more than adequate. In terms of stability and, and issues around the quality of electricity supply, the report does deal with them. Um, and uh, there are, from DNG, DNVGL's perspective, no showstoppers. Um, they think that, uh, that that can be adequately managed in the system that we envisage. Um, and National Grid and others are, at the moment, uh, trying to come up with tools to address how, how the system will be operated in a, in a very high renewable scenario. Um, or, you know, one way or another, we're in the midst of an energy transition across the UK, across uh, Europe and globally. We're going to have to develop the tools uh, and practices uh, to, to manage uh, high renewables, to uh, maintain voltage in those circumstances. And the best minds out there are struggling with these issues at the moment. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. We have, a, you know, we're not talking about an overnight change to the system. We're talking about a transition over uh, 15 years or so, uh, which we think is adequate to, to prepare for those kind of issues. Just one quick. Um, you, you said that Professor Hazeldean has said that interconnections have to treble, and presumably one of the ones you've, you've, you've talked about that's in the pipeline is the HVDC Western Link. However, that website states that the Western Link will bring renewable energy from Scotland to homes and businesses in England and Wales, so it's predominantly aimed at exporting electricity, and we know that the UK uh, energy market, predominantly south of the border, is dependent on imports from the interconnectors from France, Netherlands, and also from Wales, and also from the uh, from Scotland's um, exports. So where would that extra capacity come from? I think most of the time it will continue to operate exactly as it does. Uh, Scotland will continue to be a net exporter given the, the strong uh, renewables uh, potential and existing capacity that we have. Uh, I think the concerns about uh, security of supply at a GB level have been overstated. Um, while the, the capacity margin is, is um, narrowing this w last winter and this winter, it's quite clear that it's uh, increasing again in the coming years. The uh, Ofgem and, and National Grid uh, have introduced a whole suite of new tools to address the short-term issues, things like the, uh, the uh, SBR. 
Um, but also the capacity market has been introduced by the UK government longer term that's specifically designed to ensure that the GB system ha as a whole has the capacity it needs to meet peak demand. Now, we have some uh, <coughs> concerns that there are elements of uh, that the capacity market could be doing better. Uh, it could be incentivising uh, demand side response, demand management better. Um, it could be uh, a little bit more consistent with our decarbonisation objectives. But that tool is specifically designed to ensure that we have the capacity we need to meet peak demand at those times when renewables aren't available on the system. Okay. But it, 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 back to, to the point that Malcolm Kay made earlier, what are the market designs we need to do to incentivise that? Okay. Dr. Reid. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to... to, to to really point out that the, the system that's being talked about in that kind of vision is it is different to the system we have now so the same um, rules don't necessarily apply in terms of system design we will need new elements in the power system in order to make it happen so that's things like much more use of demand side response cross-sectoral energy exchanges so maybe converting electricity to fuel um, uh, or syngas or um, well, uh, some, some type of gas, um, energy storage um, at all levels in the, in the power system. So you, you can find that it's difficult to imagine this future system if you don't include all these extra elements. They need to, they need to be brought into the system as a whole. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, Lewis McDonald. Yeah. Just to get the grips with the European Energy Union pros uh, possibility... I guess there's a couple of questions. One which has been partly touched on, but, but I don't think fully answered. Capacity margins are narrowing in Scotland and in GB, but they're also narrowing in other European Union countries. And they're doing it for the same reason as they're doing it here, which is thermal plants coming offline and not being replaced, or certainly not being replaced like for like, and an increasing uh, dependence on renewable energy. Those are all uh, developments in line with policy decisions that have been made in, in member states and, and, and more widely, they do raise the resource question of uh, where northern European countries are all uh, increasing their energy policy in the same direction and face the same challenge uh, in relation, for example, to low pressure during winter months when, when the wind doesn't blow. So there's that fundamental question which um, I would like, um, perhaps Malcolm Kay would, I know he's addressed some of this in his paper and I wonder if there's something he would like to kick off on that what, what does this contain within it um, solutions or is it simply a, a, a helpful backup um, which still begs the question of what's done to ensure sufficient generation here and in other member states um, well I agree that there is a, there is a problem here um, I think in the short term capacity payments and the sort of mechanisms that Gina was talking about are probably going to have to be introduced, but I think they are actually not the right measures for the longer term. I think, as I was hinting earlier, the fundamental problem is one of broken markets. There is no proper way for markets to give signals either to consumers or to producers about what they should be building and when they should be operating, and that just means that they, they're not performing their proper function. Um, Capacity payments are essentially a short-term fix. They're like a sort of patch on a failed um, operating system. They're not really going to allow a new operating system. As Dr. Wade said, the new, the new system is going to be very, very much more complicated. It's not just going to be a matter of forecasting peak demand and ensuring there's enough supply available. It's about integrating a very large number of sources. And I don't think governments have remotely started to get to grips with this yet. Firstly, at the moment, um, according to a report for the EU, something like 90% of support um, for the process of decarbonisation or for, for intervention in energy more generally, actually, is on the supply side. Only 10% is on the demand side. A small proportion of that is on energy efficiency, and quite absurdly, the largest single measure of support on the demand side is in um, special tax favours, you know, relief from carbon taxes and so on, which is quite perverse in the terms of the situation we're talking about. So the first thing I think is needed is a, is a much more integrated policy overall. Um, and markets essentially need reforming the what this support on the supply side is basically just about pushing investment onto the system 
It's not market reform, although it's described as that. And there is nothing in that to optimise the investment, to make sure you've got the right mix of investment or the right mix between supply investment and the sort of demand investment, storage and so on. There are no, there's nothing equivalent to feed-in tariffs on the demand side and so on. So at the moment, we are creating an unstable situation in which you can get, as you say, this excess of a certain sort of generation. There is nothing in the market to cope with that. It is difficult ultimately for I think for any government in the present circumstances to say what is going to be optimum we simply don't know because we don't know how much consumers value reliability how much they would be prepared to put into storage how much they'd be prepared to be flexible to use things like say off-peak storage heating to use battery storage in the house how much central system storage would be economic because at the moment there are no viable signals in the market for that so I think it's um premature in many ways to say we know what the outcome is. We don't. We don't know until we've tested out a lot of these things. But the first thing to do is to test them out. Meanwhile, I think we have to live with the sort of suboptimal situation you're describing and try and use the patches like capacity payments and so on to cope with the fallout. But that can't be the ideal long-term solution. Do, does that mean, if I can follow that up, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously interested in other people's views, but does that mean if governments have not yet reached the right solutions in their own national territory, does that mean that the European Union um, or the creation of an energy union might also be premature in the sense that how do you put together different systems effectively if the ones you're putting together aren't yet, at, ha haven't yet solved the problem or, or, or cracked the crack the problem that they need to... I think ideally the energy union should be an opportunity, not a problem from this point of view. I say ideally because it, if you look at the small print of the energy union, the European strategy paper, it says the Commission is going to look at a new market design to better integrate renewables and demand response. So I think it recognises the challenge... Um, I may be unduly pessimistic. I'm not sure if it's going to come up with something that's adequate to meet the challenge, but at least that's a first step. And I think for the sort of reasons that have been discussed, it makes sense for something to happen across Europe. It's going to be much cheaper to, to do this on a, on a basis which allows the whole resources across Europe to be used. You've been talking, for instance, about the deficit in capacity in Northern Europe. Well, some Southern European countries, Spain, for instance, has got about twice as much capacity as its peak demand. It has an excess of capacity because basically you're not allowed by law to close a power station there, so it's got a lot of power station that it doesn't need. Even in Germany, there are sort of rules about when you can close a power station. So it's, it's a bit of a messy situation across Europe, but there's no doubt that all that resource could be used better. For instance, the huge solar resource in Spain could be probably better used from a European point of view. But only if there is some coherent way of coordinating this, because given all the complications I've mentioned, I'm not sure that governments sitting centrally can do it. I think you have to have some market signals helping it to happen. Regarding the, the um, energy union, I think I very much uh, I very much agree. We have to uh, bear in mind that this will uh, um, require uh, a change of mindset on behalf of member states because the energy union is uh, um, is labelled as a union, but in technical terms, it's not a union to the extent that there is no shift of sovereignty towards a more centralised level in the in the whole uh, document. So the policy making in uh, um, in legal in procedural terms is just going to stay um, as it was in the past. Um, now. Uh, capacity mechanism might provoke some sort of uh, um, delay or uh, or uh, um, harm to this process. It's very difficult to to find some consistency. And in the um, energy union communication, it was clearly stated that the functioning internal market uh, does not need capacity mechanism. Um, I think that there's a first step. Something extremely important would be to um, have a um, a common assessment of uh, of generation adequacy because this combination of uh, 
uh, member states elaborating their own capacity markets and uh, assessing generation adequacy themselves raise the possibility for uh, um, quite a lot of concentration of capture of uh, um, undesired uh, consequences that might be in the end very harmful for, uh, for further integration. And, and surely the, then, and, and I'm, sh I'm sure that's right, but, but, but if, if the authority, the sovereign authority over uh, each member state's uh, uh, transmission system remains at member state level, there is also presumably a risk of political judgments being made. A, a member state might choose not to follow the market um, and, and instead to look after domestic pr priorities ahead of um, interconnection and transmission. Is that is that a realistic risk? I mean, clearly behind the energy union lies, lie issues, political issues from Eastern Europe, but there are also political issues within Western Europe that um, will have a say in these things as well. Uh, well, in indeed, this uh, the risk, risk is very much present. Um, member states have uh, um, have gone for very um, national consideration to this extent so far. Uh, for instance, France has put a lot of obstacles to its own interconnection uh, with Spain, and um, as a result, let's say of this political impetus coming from the from the energy union process. The Commission has been um, able of uh, sort of strike a deal between France and Spain that can pave the way for uh, for further interconnection. So these are steps that go in the in the right direction, but at the same time there are a lot of steps that might go in the wrong direction. Mr. Key. Yeah. Small footnote to that. I think it's not just a question of political interference. National regulators have duties, they have um, obligations, they have responsibilities, and they're framed, obviously, in national terms to their own national, um, you know, their national consumers and their, 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 their national systems. Um, I think as long as there isn't, um, it, and cooperation between national regulators can take you so far, but until there is something at European level whose duty is to the European system and to European consumers in general, I, I don't think you're ever going to be able to get out of that. And it's not just a question of political interference, it's a question of the, the, the structures in place and people even without political interference following their, their own um, duties and obligations in, in a perfectly um, uh, uh, fair way without outside interference would still create problems in terms of the sorts of things we're talking about. Can I ask a, a, on, a, on, a, on a slightly different question, but, but, but briefly, going back to um, the convener's earlier line of questioning, the electricity generating uh, policy statement from the Scottish Government assumes a number of things by 2030, su substantial investment in renewables, three new thermal, thermal power stations um, uh, uh, with, with carbon capture and storage or the capacity to take carbon capture and storage and increased interconnection. I don't think we've yet heard a witness who said all of these things are going to happen or are all uh, desirable in the development of the Scottish uh, uh, generation in the 2020s. Is it time that generating policy statement was updated? Does that need to change? I wonder if Gina could... I think from our perspective, the EGPS is, is a foundation, but it's not fit for purpose anymore. It's not in, in line with commercial realities um, and it doesn't have enough emphasis, particularly on the demand side of the equation. It's very much a generation policy statement. Uh, we'd like to see uh, the Scottish Government come f forward with a very clear demand reduction strategy, uh, whether that's as part of a wider um, electricity statement or a standalone strategy in itself. While the Scottish Government doesn't have all the levers in those respects, of course, it, it's, it's primarily a, a UK competence. Um, it does have uh, some significant levers, uh, some money that could be uh, put towards uh, incentivising demand reduction, behaviour change and, and, and a number of uh, areas where it controls, including heat and transport. That the, the, the interaction between those and the electricity system are very significant. So I think, uh, yes, it needs, it needs a review at this stage. Okay. okay, thanks for that. I need to move on back to Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, just, on, just on that point of the EU wider market, um, the European Commission uh, issued uh, their Energy Union fact sheet, and it says uh, on the internal energy market, the Commission will provide enhanced rules for cross-border energy trade 
and propose appropriate measures to encourage renewable energy producers to better integrate in the wider electricity market. So, question: my first question is, what do you think those new, new rules would be? Could it be um, the introduction of uh, an even playing field in terms of flat charging regime, given that 25 of the 28 countries in Europe have some form of flat charging regime? And if it is an introduction of a flat charging regime for transmission charges, does that mean that the existing transmission charging regime uh, has been a disadvantage to, one, to Scotland, but if we become part of a, a wider EU market, if we retain the existing charging regime, will it be a disadvantage to the UK to attract inward investment? Um, okay, yeah. I'm not sure we know exactly what the Commission means in, in all, including its market reform proposals. It has come up with some new proposals on state aids for renewables. It's obviously trying to introduce some uh, uniformity. But to be frank, I think the Commission does not expect, given the underlying treaty position that it, this is for member states, that it can do away with separate national renewables regimes. It can introduce a degree of coordination. And I think that a lot of what it's doing here is not so much about the renewable support, apart from what it's done through the state aids guidance. I think a lot of it is about um, some more technical aspects, for instance, the way balancing markets work, the way... I mean, there are different rules, for instance, in different member states about um, constraining off, you know, when there's too much renewables generation. There are different rules about how far um, renewables generators have to keep within their forecast um, production. You know, for a wind farm, often it's not, it is not that easy unless you get the incentive to forecast your production precisely. But in some countries like Spain, where they've got a lot of renewables, they face exactly the same obligations as um, other generators, and they manage to, to forecast pretty well. Um, so I think it's as much about coordinating those sorts of more technical aspects um, and uh, getting roughly similar systems. Renewables, are, are, as you probably know, are supposed to have priority of access to um, the, the, the transmission system. But precisely what that means in practice is interpreted in different uh, ways in different states. So I think it's all about those sorts of things. I think the fundamental position, though, is going to be that the Commission understands that in practice all member states are going to go on supporting renewables in different ways with different prices with slightly different sorts of support schemes and that is a problem for the single market. But I, I think it sees no way out of that. Yeah, yeah I, I suppose on the transmission charging I think that what it, what it tries to do is be cost reflective so connecting distant uh, wind farms is relatively expensive but the benefit of having that wind farm installed is that it's in a very good wind regime so you kind of you get the benefit of the location in terms of the energy that you're able to produce but there is then a cost to that because your transmission costs are are higher so it's a way of um judging whether a scheme is economically viable clearly it's a very complicated um uh economic regime in terms of the subsidies that are given the the different carbon credits or um or, or whatnot but it's it's it, it, it's producing a a break on the projects that are going to add, add real significant costs to the to the transmission um to the transmission system so i don't think the principle of it being expensive to connect uh generation in in areas where it's difficult is is wrong but but that's not to say that the, you know, you've got to look at all of the, the, um, the incentives that are given and the disincentives and see whether that's um, hitting the right balance or not. Okay. Um, so, what, what about the the view that the the charging regime will um, could disadvantage inward investment? Is is that? Is that something you would agree with, or, or not? Well, like I said, I think you've got to you look at it in the whole. I mean, the 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 wind regime. So the amount of wind power that you can take from from those locations is very good. So that means that the 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 amount of energy you can produce is 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 better than um, 
the locations which are perhaps a bit closer to the to a, a, a firm bit of a transmission system. So it's 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 really the balance of those two things. Thank you. Right. No. Okay. Thanks, uh, John McAlpin. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to um, move on to the um, whether the market structure was um, was in place uh, to deliver the decarbonised electricity regime by 2030, which is what the Go Scottish government wants to see, um, and in particular um, the whole issue of, of pumped storage. Um, the incentives for pumped storage, which are obviously important to complement uh, Scotland's um, wind energy, are the incentives in place for pumped storage that we need? Yeah. I'm happy to have a first bash at that. Um, I think quite clearly um, the market design uh, that currently exists isn't going to be enough to get us to 2030 and beyond and the, the truly kind of flexible, dynamic, low carbon system of the future that we're, we're working towards. Um, at present, the UK electricity market doesn't provide any real incentives for building new pump storage. We know that there are two uh, significant projects uh, in the pipeline in Scotland, Cruachan 2 and Curra Gloss. Um, and at the moment, there is no way to get a return on investment uh, at, at this stage um, through the capacity market or any other mechanism. So I think it's, it's certainly... If we, if we accept that we will need some sort of storage in the, the future and that pump storage might have a, a role to play, I think we do need to uh, assess uh, how we might incentivise that. I don't have the answers, but I think um, certainly it's something that the UK government needs to get together with the energy companies and those uh, who have, have interests to, to discuss how that might come about. More widely, I think the uh, market as it's currently designed doesn't incentivise uh, demand reduction and demand side response adequately. We know that it is the least cost way to decarbonise to privilege energy efficiency as, as the first fuel. Um, so uh, at the moment in the capacity market, for instance, demand side response actually only has a, a one year contract, whereas new generation, new gas plant generation or flexible generation has, has the uh, ability to attract a 15 year contract. So it's not on a level playing field in terms of the capacity market. And the capacity market only exists at the moment um, because there are concerns about whether there'll be enough available capacity in any given year. Once we move past any, any, um, any concerns about that, we need to think about how we can incentivise energy efficiency longer term through potentially a feed-in tariff or another mechanism, uh, as Malcolm Kay discussed. So uh, I think the signals aren't there, and we do need to think about how the electricity market works for those other system services that will be so important in the future. In, in, in general terms, I understand that the UK is, is way behind many other developed um, countries in terms of energy storage and investment in energy storage. Does anyone have any suggestions as to how... Um, policy could be uh, adjusted to change that and to help us catch up with places like the United States and, and <coughs> European countries? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's really the, the US, I would say, that are, are leading, particularly California, um, again, driven by their renewables um, commitments. They, they've recognised that storage is going to be critical for them to, um, to make that system work. Uh, I mean, we are trialling energy storage projects um, in the UK, which are, I guess, not, if you treat a pump storage as conventional energy storage, if you like, since it's been on the system for um, 30 years. Um, the, we, we are trialling um, non-conventional storage, and um, so that's be like the use of uh, batteries or liquid air as a, as a medium for storing energy. Um, and certainly anything that can be done to... Um, enhance those um, demonstration projects and to um, roll them out as, as more routine um, solutions in, in electricity networks um, is going to be beneficial. I think it's, it's worth saying that uh, the location of energy storage and the size of the storage within the system has quite a big imp impact on what it can do in the system and the uh, regulation and the markets that exist to allow an energy storage developer to recover value from the services they provide is not is not well developed and part of the aspects of these demonstration projects that are taking place is to um, show how the uh, the market 
markets and the regulation need to change in order to, to accommodate this, this storage. Um, so it, it goes much wider than um, security supply in the sense of having enough generation present, the security supply in terms of having your, uh, your electricity network able to deliver the power to all the, the nodes in the network, all the, all the demand points and uh, energy storage can play a role in uh, making making that that more secure um, more so than the sort of absolute provision of uh, of energy uh, yeah um, I'm not sure we necessarily as badly off for energy storage as you imply um, UK has got quite a large amount of off-peak storage heating, more than most countries, and that is a form of electricity storage. And I think that sort of brings up the wider point. I don't think we should be looking just in terms of um, particular technologies like pump storage. We should be looking at markets and pricing more generally so that consumers, individual consumers, have an incentive to look at ways of balancing their demand and um, storing in whatever way, which requires people to come up with imaginative retail offerings as off-peak storage heating was. It was a nice, simple offer which worked in the long term. You could envisage companies offering packages like that if there were the incentives to do so. So it's partly a matter of the way wholesale markets operate, but to a large extent it's a matter of the way retail markets operate. There's absolutely no incentive for any consumer to store electricity. It costs the same whether you use it at five in the afternoon or at um, two in the morning unless you happen to have um, an off-peak meter. What we need to do is to... And I, I know that um, for some politicians more complexity is a problem, but I don't think that should be seen as a problem. The fact is, as we've all said... The whole system is changing, and in particular it's changing from one that's based on you know, what in economic terms we call marginal costs, that's fuel costs, to renewables, which are fixed capital costs. Now, when you look at other systems like that, we're perfectly used to, say, for um, uh, you know, our telephones or our um, um, uh, internet service, we don't think we have to have that always in gigabytes or minutes of call. We used to when we had um, centralised suppliers, but people are quite able to cope with subscriptions, you know, paying for a fixed amount and getting a fixed amount for that with, um, you know, perhaps extra payments if you exceed your fixed amount, ideas like that. What we need in the electricity system is more um, innovative um, offerings at the retail end, which will actually allow us to work out how much storage consumers value and how much they need. There may well be cheaper ways of providing this sort of security in the system than simply saying we put a pump storage scheme somewhere in the, in the middle. It may well be that um, uh, you know, off-peak storage of heating is a better bet. We don't really know until consumers have the opportunity to um, respond to some sort of a retail offer and make some decisions. If I could just respond to that point, because um, uh, the last session here that I was at a couple of weeks ago, um, Dr Eddie, jo Eddie Owens rather, of... Um, Harriet Watt University suggested that it would be worth exploring whether we could use smart metering to, um, when you were talking about the way telephones charged, etc. He was saying that perhaps we could move towards a system whereby you got cheaper electricity uh, when the wind was blowing if you had smart meters and um, and a weather prediction uh, a prediction service that helped people to do that. Do you think that that's something viable? It's already happening and environmental communi uh, conscious communities across Europe, but could, it, could we give cost incentives for people to use renewables? Uh, well, I agree with the general approach. I, I, I personally think it's much too complicated if you have different prices when the wind is blowing, so you keep going, you know, having to go and look at your meter and work out the price and so on. What I think you need is a very simple retail proposal like off-peak heating. So it would be something saying that you can get cheap electricity when electricity in the system is cheap and in a system like the future Scottish one which has got a very high amount of renewables that will be for quite a lot of the time you pay more um, at certain times I mean there are vague parallels like this the French used to have a, or still do to an extent have a tariff called the red light tariff where you know a little red light came on the house and you knew electricity was more expensive I think the problem with smart meters is that they're not it's rather a half-hearted programme. It's really set up at the moment to help utilities but to avoid them having to go and read the meters, and it's not really set up to do much else. 
And as long as you have governments saying, well, we want to keep everything simple, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to have innovation and you know, new ideas being tried and so on, because the pressure is all to keep it simple and not to do this. But I think this is going to have to change, and I think it's going to, I'm afraid, require a degree of government intervention. As I said, at the moment, all the interventions on the supply side, we need some intervention on the demand side to encourage these sorts of flexible approaches to make it easier for consumers maybe to help subsidise things like, it's not just smart meters, but you would have to have them linked with smart appliances. So there'd be smart appliances, and you could tell your appliance, turn off when the price gets over 20p or whatever. I mean, the, we don't know yet, so it's difficult to say this is what they should be doing, but these are the areas we need to explore if we're going to get a, a well-designed overall system. And so if I might take slight exception to the <laughs> committee's uh, title, security of supply, I think security of supply is a bit old thing. It's not just a question of forecasting demand and making sure there's enough supply in the future. It's a much more complicated system with all the sources that Dr. Wade's spoken about having to be integrated into it. So it's still a question of security, but it's, it's, it's not just of supply. It's of all sorts of things feeding into it. And we really need to start experimenting with what the options are and seeing what people like, what people can cope with, because at the moment we just don't know, frankly. What's going on? I'll just, I'll just observe before I bring him in. I was hosting an event for smart meters recently. And one thing always occurs to me that uh, when we talk about promoting smart meters, one of the examples is given you could, you could turn your washing machine on when you go to bed because the power is cheaper. Of course, the one thing the fire brigades say you should never do is turn your washing machine on when you go to bed because it's more likely to burst into flames and burn you and your family to a crisp when you're sleeping. So I think there are various issues we need to consider around, uh, around the fringes. Uh, Dr. Wade. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I suppose I just want to add this, the smart metering programme. Um, other smart meter programmes in other countries that have taken place have not included energy efficiency in their business case or energy reduction rather um so the, the the business case has been around theft of energy and um yeah the reduction in the utilities costs in in get, getting the meter data um but the the uk smart metering business case does include an element of um uh, energy reduction within it so that that is something that's expected to come from it um but the thing i was going to say is that the you don't necessarily want to think about demand side um, response in terms of cost because the cost signals are typically very small. So the amount of energy that you can actually, or the amount of value that you can give to the system by reducing your consumption is, it's on an individual level is quite small. But there are um, investigations going on into whether through essentially ed educating people about the their role within the energy system and getting a community kind of level of interest in uh, energy use that you can aggregate up those very small um, energy um, those benefits that you get through through your interaction with the with the power system and um, yeah approach it in a much more of a sort of community um, based kind of way but you, you, you need people to become more familiar with their their impact on the on the on the energy system and um, just generally more more um, conscious of their their the, the effect of their actions and how it fits within within the community so I, th I think that kind of approach we don't necessarily have to chase um, pence which is ultimately what it is it's it's um, um, people understanding the system and appreciating that they they can play a role and that perhaps as a community they can get some benefit from that okay all right Okay, Patrick Harvey's keen to come in and follow up questions about demand reduction. Just before we leave storage, I just wanted to, to raise a point that Professor Hazeldean raised in his evidence with us last week on, on storage, uh, and talking specifically about uh, pump storage and the volume that would be required. He said if we, have, if we had a simple uh, system where we were heavily reliant on, on wind power, that would mean, uh, according to him, we would need around 10 or 15 additional Kruikin-type pump storage schemes which would be a huge amount uh, and obviously a very substantial capital uh, cost to, to, to build if indeed we could ever find the sites. Does anybody have a view on the, the, the level of storage that we would, we would require? Gina? Sure. Um, I suppose if you were to accept that we were going to have a very simple system based entirely on wind power, that, that 
is a feasible scenario. But of course, we're, we're moving towards a very complex system with a diversity of, of electricity sources. Um, and uh, I think in, in that context, um, certainly I think uh, we possibly would need much less pump storage uh, than, than envisaged there. And that's not even taking into account uh, demand reduction and the need for it. So, you know, as we move towards a, a, a kind of low carbon, uh, lower demand system, the need for new kit of any sort is lower. Dr. Wheat. Yeah, just add to that, that once you get to those kind of levels, I think you need to look at a, a different type of energy storage of perhaps converting to a, a fuel stock that you can store. Um, you may have to do that at a relatively low efficiency, but um, Again, it's about looking at the whole system. Maybe you can um, um, you can take that relatively low efficiency if uh, if possible. I mean, another thing you can do is maybe uh, um, look at industries that could be introduced that can um, that can manage that level of, of flexibility um, within their processes. But so that's a, again, it's a it's another direction of, of trying to look at the whole system. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, several of the of the witnesses had mentioned uh, demand side uh, issues, and we started in the last few minutes to to go into that in a little more detail. I still wanted to explore two two basic questions. Both governments, I think, would say that they're doing something on energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency is a good thing, but it's not the same as demand reduction. We can use energy more efficiently and end up using more of it. Uh, so demand reduction, energy efficiency, and some of the more uh, some of the complexity that's come out in the last few minutes. So I think the the idea of a, a kind of energy internet, which I think Malcolm Key was hinting towards a, a few minutes ago, where it's more like a, a bit torrent exchange than a simple download, uh, if you like, where price signals might not affect individual behaviour, but they might tell you distributed generation to switch between putting its energy onto the grid and putting it into distributed storage uh, for use later. Given the range of responsibilities between UK government, regulator, Scottish government, generators, uh, national grid, what is it that the Scottish government, because that's who we're here to scrutinise, what is it that they can do to give any greater leadership on this, which would be effective given the, the range of different responsibilities? And the second question is really about the balance between how much of this can be achieved technically and how much of it does require cultural change? How much of it requires us to move to a scenario where nobody thinks it's normal to put the blinds up on the windows and burn a hundred light bulbs in the room? If I could start, I think one of the first things the um, Scottish Government could do is your report could put a lot of stress on this and less on security of supply, but more, I would say, on the need for a fully developed and integrated demand-side strategy for the Scottish Government. Now, that will be constrained by its powers, of course, but at least it can do, I think, one of the things that the Scottish Government does very well, provide a bit of a lead for the rest of the UK in saying, you know, we are addressing these issues and here is something that you could look at and try and follow. I would um, not necessarily agree that it should start off with energy efficiency. I think energy efficiency is, isn't really the, the right concept. What we're talking about is something more like smart efficiency. So to give a few examples, it's not just about um, creating efficiency overall. It's creating more responsive demand in line with the sorts of demand response we've been talking about. If you're talking about product standards, it's not just about standards for um, reducing the energy consumption of a product. It's also about standards which will enable them to fit into this new, more flexible system. So there will be smart products. There will be some sort of a standard for how smart products um, should exist. I think one thing the Scottish Government could very well do would be to trial some of these things itself. Um, because there are differences in the Scottish circumstances in, in various ways, not least the sort of housing here is quite different and um, the dispersion of population is quite different so you might well be talking about different approaches so that's another sort of set of things the Scottish Government could be doing but I think the, the the main thing is to maybe see if it could sit down and look at what an integrated um, overall strategy in properly integrating the demand side and I go back to my numbers 90% of intervention in the energy sector is on the supply side uh, of the remaining 10%, most of it is on tax relief, which doesn't seem to me the right balance. 
so the Scottish Government could at least think about um, what is possible in that area. Obviously, there are constraints. I'm, I'm not suggesting it's going to be able to come up with a groundbreaking policy overnight, but it, it could, it, it could, I think, you know, lead in the UK on this because it's um, it, it's the sort of area where the Scottish Government has shown itself, I think, imaginative. Um, I think, uh, in addition to the kind of uh, issues that Malcolm has has talked about, um, the Scottish government has has quite clear powers in the heat and transport sectors. And over time, as we electrify uh, heating and transport, there'll be much more interaction than there already is between the electricity sector and and those sectors. Um, while it doesn't have full powers over the delivery of energy efficiency, the Smith Commission recommendations, the Scotland Act, uh, will be giving Scotland the power to design a, a new energy efficiency programme on top of additional programmes or replacing them um, that will uh, work better for Scotland. So I think there's a huge opportunity there to do something quite uh, substantial on the heat side of things. Um, we have been calling for energy efficiency to be uh, considered from an infrastructure perspective, sorry, energy demand reduction, or to be considered from an, an infrastructure perspective where we would set very clear uh, goals um, about upgrading the housing stock and our building stock and try and uh, take uh, an approach where the capital budget begins to work much better for uh, the kind of changes we need to see so that we would start to invest significantly more in energy efficiency than we have been doing already with a very clear long-term goal and a very holistic whole of government approach. So I think more can be done on heat. And I think we have to acknowledge that transport policy and energy demand reduction in transport policy is very problematic in Scotland. There's currently no uh, real uh, transport policy in the RPP2, the Report and Policies and Proposals. Um, it's very much the forgotten uh, relation, the poor relation to electricity, and heat is the poor relation to electricity secondary and maybe transport tertiary. Um, so I think you know, we have to do more to reduce energy demand in that sector. Uh, so that when we move to a situation where we're uh, electrifying vehicles, we're not creating a massive problem for ourselves. So th there are a multiplicity of, of ways of addressing it. And I think looking at heat and transport is one of the where areas where Scotland can do a lot. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wade, yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I agree with, with that. Um, I, it was mentioned earlier, I think, there was this concern that maybe transmission charges might reduce investment in renewables. I think the other thing to consider is the connection cost as well um, so that's driven by the uh, again by the the, the, the the ability to connect to the network in a timely and cost effective manner and there are there are methods being investigated for for, for making connection costs lower um, do you mean? no I mean g generators I see sorry yes yeah, so sure how that connects to the, the demand side I'm well, sure. it, 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 in in the sense that it's a, it, it doesn't really connect to the demand side explicitly, but it, it, it relates to how you build how you how you build your networks and uh, what what the energy mix is going in. And, and well, I was I guess I was more addressing the point of like the, there was a concern that people might stop building renewables right. in 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 Scotland if the the, the charges are too, are too too okay. high. So I just wanted to point out that there's connection charges as well as um, transmission charges and um, th they will have an impact on whether a project goes ahead so the, there's a lot of projects that are consented but they're they're not being built because the difficulty in, in connecting well that's one, one reason why um, so and, and that relates also to the planning planning regime as well so again something that's um, that the Scottish government can have some um, direct in influence over is okay. the yeah the, the connection of, of renewables Right. Um, very briefly, Joanne Lamont. Yeah. Clear on the, the planning regime. What what changes do you think there need to be? Um, I I don't know the details of it, but I I just I know that it that it is this holding up the. I know there was evidence given from the planning um, section of the. Of, I'm not sure if it was local authorities or the or the central um, Scottish government, but um, uh, they they were highlighting in evidence that there is. Uh, you know, issues around, for, for instance, that the, the, the planning consent is only 
um, in place up to about 2020. So from 2020 onwards, there's uncertainty of whether that planning is going to get renewed. Um, but also then, as, as you get as you get more renewables built, then that reduces the ability of new generation to come on because you've got a you're accumulating more and more um, wind turbines essentially, it, and and that tends to reduce the um, success of planning that applications. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right, okay, we're at the end of our time, uh, very neatly. Thank you very much to our panel for coming along. It's been extremely useful. And we will now have a short suspension to allow a changeover.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, I'd like to welcome our second panel of witnesses. We're joined by Eric Levy, who's Head of Transmission Network Planning at Scottish Power Energy Networks, uh, Kirsty Burge, who's Partner Electricity Transmission and Head of Ofgem in Scotland, uh, David Gardner, uh, Director of Transmission Scottish and Southern Energy, and Mike Calvio, Director Transmission Network Service at National Grid. Welcome to you all and thank you for coming uh, along this morning. Now, we've got about an hour and um, 15 minutes or so uh, for this session, quite a lot of ground uh, to cover, so we'll get uh, straight into it. I would ask members, as ever, if they keep their questions uh, short and to the point and uh, responses uh, as short and to the point uh, as possible would be helpful. And because we've quite a large panel, I'd ask members if they would initially uh, direct their questions at one panel member. If you'd like to respond to a uh, a question uh, addressed to somebody else or just agree or disagree with the point somebody else has made. If you just catch my eye, I'll do my best to bring you in as time allows. I'd like to start off, if I can, with the issue of transmission charging and maybe initially address this to, to Mike Calview and then bring others in and get their views. But we've heard um, in all the evidence we've taken in this inquiry that uh, the transmission charging regime is an issue uh, for uh, many people uh, involved in the sector. If we take the view that Scotland needs new thermal capacity, and obviously there is a debate around that, you'll have heard that from our previous evidence, but if we take the view that we need new thermal capacity, then uh, the current level of transmission charges act as a barrier to that being constructed in Scotland. And I wonder if, Mr Calvi, I could ask you, if you can in fairly simple terms, just to explain why we have the current transmission charging regime uh, that we have in in the UK, uh, who uh, benefits from that, uh, who are the winners, who are the losers, what are the alternatives um, and why you feel uh, the current system is, is a better than the alternatives. Okay. And if you could try and do that in a few sentences, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. I like a challenge, Murdo. Um, yeah, so in, in GB, we have an energy market that has a single energy price. So effectively, everybody has open access to the same market. We pay the same for energy coming on, on, on off the grid at the wholesale level. Um, the locational transmission charges is effectively acting as a signal to participants in those markets around the long-run impact of their impacts and ultimately for decisions, their decisions about where to build and, uh, and obviously as well where to close. Um, on the cost of the transmission network. So as you know, we actually have an awful lot of generation coming on in Scotland. Uh, we are having to spend an awful lot investing in the grid across uh, National Grid and uh, my colleagues in uh, Scottish Power Transmission and uh, SHE Transmission. And effectively, the transmission pro uh, charges provide a long run economic signal to the market reflecting those costs. Um, the costs are uh, equal and opposite, effectively, for generation and demand. So they, at the moment, they are higher in, in the north of England and Scotland for generation and lower for demand customers. Uh, and that's a, and that, you know, that's a key point, effectively, and, and, it's, and it's the opposite. So in the south of England, it's lower for generation and they go negative, uh, but it's much higher for demand customers. And that, effectively, is, is reflecting the, the direction of flow on the network. So for Scotland, we do have an excess of generation. Currently, peak demand in Scotland is 5.4 gigawatts. We've currently got uh, uh, about 11 gigawatts of generation uh, connected in, in Scotland. And I've got a further queue of 13 gigawatts of additional generation with contracts to connect the network. So that's, that's the background position. Um, the benefit, and uh, Kirsty can probably add to this, is all the studies that we've done, Ofgem have done, have basically shown that that cost reflectivity has long-term economic benefits for all customers. It encourages overall an efficient network to be developed and planned, and that benefits customers. Um, clearly, if you went away from that, people talk about flat charging, you wouldn't get that benefit. And clearly in Scotland, the immediate impact of going to flat charging would be to raise bills for Scottish customers by about £10 a customer. So, you know, that, that but clearly it would benefit Scottish generation. I think the other fact to add is, is, you know, there is a lot of talk about Europe and how other countries in Europe do this. And I think, no doubt, over time, we will see increased harmonisation across Europe of how we do transmission charging. But, yes, many other countries in Europe don't have locational transmission charges for generation, but, but they do tend to have locational energy markets. So if you look at Scandinavia, they effectively run a single market but with different price zones across different bits of Scandinavia. So effectively, the locational signal comes through the energy market rather than the transmission market. And 
it, the European Commission's proposal single market are talking about concepts known as market coupling and market splitting. So, you know, an idea that could happen is you could move to a world where we don't have locational transmission charges, but you then say, have more granular price zones in different parts of the network. So where there are big transmission constraints, you split the market into different price zones. The impact would be very broadly the same. So you would effectively have energy prices in Scotland on average being lower because of the excess of renewable generation in Scotland, particularly when the wind's blowing, you'd see very low prices. Obviously, that'd be good for consumers, not good for local generation. And equally, you'd probably have higher energy prices on average in England and Wales. And, that's a, and that is an active you know, debate about, is it better to do the locational signal through the energy market or through the transmission prices? Um, we're probably, you know, um, you know, we can argue for either. The current method has some benefit of simplicity. Moving to a fully locational energy market would be complex. I think you could argue long term there are um, economic efficiency opportunities for moving that direction. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm keen to, to, to bring Kirsty Bergen and others in, and I want to hear in a moment about um, this issue about impact on consumers. I think it's quite important. But can I just follow up a couple of points if I can, Mr. Calview? Um, just so I understand this correctly. Um, you talked about um, the the increased capacity on the grid that was uh, had been constructed was coming in. Is it the case essentially that the more the more capacity you create in a particular area, the more the charges go up? Um, no, effectively, what 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 the charges do? They're sort of long run average charges. So um, we the broadly the charges affect the direction of flows on the network and where we're having to invest, um, but. But effectively, actually, uh, the, the, the charges will then be quite dynamic and responsive to what's happening on the network. One of the things we're introducing next year, subject to the um, judicial review into, in, in, uh, which is happening this summer, um, with our new charges, we're splitting the charges into a peak security charge and an economic charge. We, uh, and, and the key thing that does is effectively recognise that we're building a lot of the network at the moment for intermittent renewables, and that's causing us to make a lot of investment. But that's not necessarily the same as what the network we need for to meet winter peak when maybe the wind's not blowing. So the, the impact of those changes coming next year is actually charges for generation in Scotland will be going down next year with Project Transmit. And particularly, the, the, it gives the potential for if there are further close, closures of base load generation capacity in Scotland in the future, that actually will a signal then will emerge for new peak capacity or storage or demand side or whatever the right economic solution is to meet those peak, peak, peak demands via the transmission charging signal. Um, so it is quite a dynamic system, uh, you know, part, you know the, the numbers do move around, um, but broadly making more investment in the transmission network doesn't by itself uh, cause uh, the price to go up, it's effectively just a, a, a feature of the net generation demand in each area and where the power flowing on the network. So if, if we're seeing more wind capacity coming on the grid and more of that being created, what impact does that have on the charges for baseload conventional plant? Does that... Does that push those up? Well, as I said, so with assuming Project Transmit is implemented as planned by next year, then the um, the 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 charge for a generator in Zone Nine, which is the the zone which Longanet is uh, uh, um, uh, located in, just to give an example, is currently seventeen pound per kilowatt. Next year, we're forecasting it go to down to thirteen pound per kilowatt, given the current generation we expect to be on the network. However, um, we haven't had any, uh, we actually haven't had any um, uh, notification yet about Longanet's intentions. So assuming that Longanet closes as, as they've indicated, they probably will, but they haven't actually formally said they will, it would actually reduce down to three pound per kilowatt. Now, you know, so just to show it is quite dynamic to what's actually happening on the network. Um, the, the, the charges for the intermittent wind farms will be higher because effectively that's, the, that's the, where the ec economy criteria kicks in and it's basically a charge that sort of applies to people that are running throughout the year and it depends on their load factor. So the, it's, 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 we're, it's a more sophisticated system we move to. It's splitting out peak security from, from sort of year-round running and it will depend on the nature of the generation connection network. Okay, I'm going to bring Scottish Power in a minute because I think this is quite interesting because Scottish Power told us previously when we took evidence that there was no uh, business case to build a new gas station in Scotland on the Longanet site, for example, or somewhere else because of high transmission charges. But 
What, what you've just told us is, is that if Longanet closes, there would then be a substantial reduction in the submission charging. Um, so if somebody wanted to build a new gas station, they wouldn't be facing the barrier that is currently being faced. Well, I think obviously if they then built, depending on how big it was, because clearly because the charges do depend on what's connected. So people will, you know, model, you know, if you were build a, a gigawatt or two gigawatts, so effectively a place long gannet, then you'd obviously go back to where you started. So I, so I think what Scottish Power Generation said was absolutely right. I think the point I'm trying to make is the charges is sufficiently dynamic so that if you get to a point in the future, and I know, you know you've you've talked about what happens post 2023 or whenever the, the existing nuclear stations close, when there is a clear need for investment in further peaking capacity, and and, and I'll say peaking capacity rather than thermal because I you know I think it's up to the market to work out how most efficiently to deliver that. Um, then the, there is scope in the transmission charges to start to incentivise that when it's needed. My view is I don't think it is needed at the moment from the work we've done um, and you know, clearly from the fact that even if Longanit does closure, there is still an excess of generation over, over, over peak demand in Scotland. Okay, I'm, I'm probably it's fair to bring in Mr Levy at this point from Scottish Power's perspective, just get your view on the transmission charging regime. Uh, good morning. I would like to just clarify that um, SP transmission doesn't really have a bearing on how the charging regime would be operated. So it's a bit transparent from our business point of view. We, we provide assets on the basis of need and we provide them to all comers who require uh, transmission capacity. So we, we don't really um, get involved in the market for generation or the use of the system. We, we provide the assets in a cost-effective and efficient manner. Yes, yeah, so I appreciate you're not from the, 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 the part of Scottish Power that's involved in electricity generation. Perhaps we should have made that clearer at the start. You're from the transmission side. Yeah. Well, it, it was to say that for business separation purposes, uh, we, we are totally separated from the generation and retail parts of Scottish Power in the wires business. Side. Right. But, but does Scottish Power have a view on transmission charging as a, as a policy stance? It's not really appropriate for me to comment on other parts of Scottish Power than you. <laughs> As from a transmission owner point of view, we, we, we don't have a bearing on what the policy should be. Okay. Okay. Our, our focus is to okay. keep the cost down and providing the infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Mr Gardner from SSE, are you in the, are you in the same in a, in a similar boat? I'm in a similar... <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, good, good, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm the committee... It's a, it's a sort of similar position. Uh, SSE has submitted written, written evidence from the, you know the corporate SSE, which covers you know it covers the the wholesale generation side. It's similar there. I think probably I would pro add to it is that you know we have a system in the north of Scotland. I have a lot of customers that are connected to that system. I, I personally, having a, being a transmission op operator, would like more people to connect. So. Uh, if, if transmission prices, you know, reduced in the north of Scotland, it would help my business to expand. But that's uh, that's where I am. But uh, out with uh, you, know, you know, with, with regards to any other comments, I'm really very much aligned with what SPTR. Okay, thanks. Okay, I, I want to go to Kirsty Barry. Let's go back to this point that we touched on a moment ago about the cost to consumers, and you know, what is the impact of the transmission charging regime we have as opposed to moving towards. A, a socialised or, or postage stamp system. Can you can you say something about that? Yeah, happy to do that. And again, thanks for having me. Um, it's a good good to be able to to give evidence to to the committee. Um, and just to so just to emphasise the, the the point that Mike said about the reason we have the transmission charging regime we do um, is. We have a cost-reflective regime, and the reason for that is that it keeps costs down for all consumers. Because what it does is it makes sure that when firms invest in generation, both you know the type of generation where they situate, they take into account these costs when they make these decisions, and consumers ultimately pay the the cost of the whole energy system. Be that you know um, uh, you know the fossil fuel price, be that the transmission network, be that the distribution network. Consumers pay for that, and that's the, that's a bit that we really really have to hold on to. And by having a cost reflective charging regime, that incentivizes the parties on the market side of the business to keep the costs down as much as they can, while still ensuring that we have security of supply 
and we meet our environmental target. So that's why we have a cost-reflective charging regime. And that does have dis different impacts on different uh, generators uh, situated in different parts of the, the country. And, and what we did, and Mike alluded to this, as part of Project Transmit, which was our um, review of charging arrangements, is we looked at, well, what, what would be the cost if we took a more postage stamp approach, so socialise the cost of transmission charging? across the board. And, and what we found was that that would add about £7 billion to consumers' bills. And I think there was a lot of, of support that this, this was indeed the case. And it, it does logically flow from the fact that if you don't incentivise parties to take the most efficient decisions, they, they, it is going to cost more. So, so that's, that is why, fundamentally, we have a, a cost-reflective charging regime in Great Britain. The, the other point to, to bring out, and Mike also talked about this, is that charges are paid both by generators directly and also consumers. And the way it's currently split in Britain is that generators pay about a quarter of the charges, whereas consumers pay about three quarters of the charges. And yes, generators... Um, located in Scotland and more remote areas will pay higher charges, everything else being equal than, than generators close to the very big centres of demand. Um, but the converse of that is that consumers in these kind of areas, and that includes Scotland and, and part of Scotland, pay significantly less um, through the, the three quarters of uh, transmission charges that they pay for directly. So, for example, um, if a, a large, and this, this impacts obviously on businesses, um, but also domestic consumers who pay through this through their, their bills, their suppliers. So, for example, if you have a large demand customer situated in the charging region where Longanit is, um, say an energy intensive user, their transmission charges would be something like £2 million a year, whereas an equivalent type of customer situated in, in London would pay about double that, about £4 million a year. Okay, so, so the current system protects consumers in Scotland, is what you're saying? I, I think b because there's, and this is, goes back to the point that Mike made, because there's an excess of generation in Scotland, that means um, consumers benefit from that to some extent because they are situated quite close to where that excess demand is. The other point that Mike made is that this is a fluid and dynamic situation, so that changes. When a, power, when a large power station closes, that balance changes and consumers pay a little bit more. Um, and, and generators pay, pay a little bit less. But that, that is a current situation in, in Scotland now. OK, thanks. OK, other members want to come in and start with Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Yeah. Um, I've got a number of questions on this about whether it benefits consumers or not. First one is, just for my, for my own benefit, um, the, the existing transmission charges, uh, etc., what everybody says is, it's about where population is. It's about the transfer of electricity to where the population is. So for modelling purposes, where do you uh, envisage the population centre is? Well, just to be clear, I think when people talk about population centres, they're trying to sort of like simplify it. It's, 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 a, it's a function of where the generation is coming onto the system and where the demand is coming off the system. Obviously, population centres drive large demand. There are obviously very large population centres in Scotland, and if there wasn't much generation in Scotland, you would see a real, a really low uh, price uh, transmission charge for Scotland because it would be close to the population centre. But because at the moment we have more generation in Scotland than is needed to meet peak demand, that effectively, that excess generation is being modelled as, as, as reality, which is it's flowing down the system, down towards the south of the country, which is effectively where there isn't enough local generation. And effectively, therefore, the model reflects um, the fact that all those transmission wires are you know, under pressure in terms of needing further investment to, 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 carry, to carry that um, power um, effectively down south in that case. So it's not quite as simple as just where is the local population centres. It's where, you know, we, we clearly know where the demand is on all parts of the system, where it's coming off, where it's going on, and we model all of that. And that model is published. Everybody is, as in the industry can run it themselves. Um, you know, you can put in different scenarios so that, you know, we try to be very open and transparent on that. And anybody in the market who wants to, you know, sort of uh, try out different scenarios with different generators coming on and off or different views on whether demand's increasing or decreasing, that's all available. 
So basically you're saying that the generators are being penalised by trying to keep the lights on south of the border. I mean, what we're, what we're saying is that um, Scottish and Southern Energy's um, written evidence says that um, that where are we? Sorry about this. Um, the average figure mass differences in charges paid by generators in Scotland uh, up to £25,540 per megawatt per annum compared to what happens in Cornwall where they actually receive £5,804 per megawatt per annum for using the transmission system. Who ultimately pays that? Is it not the customer that pays that? And therefore... Um, it's the customer that's bearing that additional difference of in, in excess of thirty thousand pounds. Well, the the charges provide a cost reflective signal on the cost of using the system. So, if you know there is in parts of the system, such as um, the southwest of England, there is a reasonable amount of demand still, there isn't much local generation, and therefore we have to spend money effectively reinforcing the system to get the power to those customers. If local generation locates there, that defers that generation, and therefore that's a benefit, and effectively the cost, so the, 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 the uh, negative charge to the generators in those areas effectively reflects, affects the cost that we save in terms of our investment in the system. Um, you know, ultimately, as Kirsty says, all of this is paid by consumers. The location aspect just provides a cost reflect, a reflective um, sort of overlay on on what's paid by consumers, and you know, and that is important to know. I mean, just to give another flavour, uh, obviously you are particularly focused on what happens in Scotland. You know, the the overall transmission revenue for my colleagues here in Scottish Power Transmission and She Transmission is about six hundred thirty million pound a year at the moment. The amount actually raised by Scottish market participants, both generation and demand, is about less than 300 million. So basically, um, the transmission charging re you know, mechanism is ultimately getting England and Wales consumers to pay a large amount of the cost of reinforcing the Scottish network. Lights on south of the border. I mean, but that, no, that no. is to reflect the benefit. There is a lot of generation coming on in Scotland. I wouldn't necessarily agree about keeping lights on, but it's to, in order to efficiently transport all of the low carbon generation coming on Scotland into the rest of the system. With export levels and uh, export uh, record export levels in 2013 to south of the border, 10 percent of its energy requirements is dependent on the interconnectors. The, the, the import from Wales and the import in, from Scotland. So, you know, we're basically penalising uh, Scottish generators for keeping the lights on south of the border. Well, and secondly, uh, the, the, you, you said... Well, I think it's really fair to let Mr Calvi <laughs> on to that point. <laughs> yeah, it's not penalising, it is a cost-effective signal. If, if, and it's clearly, the, given the amount of generation we have uh, applying to connect to our network... You know, as I say, we have more generation applied to connection on our network than we can connect at the moment in, in the timescales we need to. So that is a challenge that all of us as transmission companies are dealing with, trying to get as much generation in Scotland onto the network as we can. So it's not right. penalising, it's providing a My signal. final question. And, final. And, and, and there, and effectively, the economics, the benefits of, in terms of the wind resource in Scotland are outweighing that signal. So we're ultimately getting to the right answer, which in this case is to build the uh, most, you know, arguably sort of uh, most effective low carbon resource in Scotland and to reinforce a network. But in other cases, there might be other stuff which it doesn't make sense to build in Scotland because there's no underlying advantage in Scotland. And so you might as well put it closer to the, to the demand. That's the way the system works. It, 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 it incentivises efficient decisions. And if, if the, the market and, and the transmission system a charging regime works in the benefit of... Uh, keeping prices down for consumers. Now, there's two elements to consumers as households and as industry. Um, if you look at the Eurostat numbers comparing prices from 2011 to 2013, and only looking at the countries that are connected to the UK, in other words, can sell electricity to the UK, um, you see that um, during that period to households, France had a 7% increase, Netherlands had a 10% increase in price, Norway had a 10% reduction, and the UK's price went up 22%. When you look at industry, 
There is a similar pattern, albeit that Netherlands price also come down by 2% at the same time as cost to industry went up 20%. And all three countries, France, Netherlands and Norway, as of 2013, which was the latest figures on Eurostat, had substantially uh, lower prices than the UK, which um, providing power to, to industry. And obviously, to be competitive, you know, power costs are one of the largest costs that a, a company can bear, and especially for a manufacturing company. So if the market and if the transmission charges are, are, are delivering low costs, how is that not reflected in Eurostat numbers? Well, I mean, I think clearly there are an awful lot of things that go into those end customer views, uh, you know, about, you know, fundamentally generation mix, access to natural resources. So, you know, I absolutely uh, believe and agree with Ofgem's analysis that the transmission charging regime does lead to efficient decision making, which is a benefit to consumers trying to analyse exactly what's driving different, uh, you know, things by company is clearly exchange rates, you get different taxations, there's just a whole load of stuff that, you know, I'm probably not the best person to talk to you about explaining. I think, you know, I, what I can say is clearly there are opportunities for efficient trading, as I think you've heard from other witnesses before, between European countries to get benefits. So in some cases, some of those countries, you know, do have access to either natural resources or, you know, sort of in France's case, a very large, arguably subsidised nuclear programme. And that does give opportunities if we increase interconnection with them to, again, um, you know, bring consumer benefits, uh, particularly as we move to more and more intermittent low, genera uh, low carbon generation because we have lots of opportunities for share sharing between different countries. Yeah. It's probably a good point at which to just take a step back and think about the different components of the bill and, and the role that transmission and distribution charges and others have of that. I think, I'm not, probably not going to get my numbers exactly right here, but, but I think wholesale prices account for something like 50 to 60% of the bill. And then distribution charges I think are about 20% and transmission charges are about 5% of the bill. And, and again, as Mike said, um, energy prices, both to households and businesses, are driven by a range of factors. But the, the very, very big part of that is actually the composition of the energy mix. And I think for the period you talked about, I think it was at 20, 2011 to 2013. And um, so these countries have very, very different energy mixes. Again, I'm not going to be precise here. But, but France is primarily nuclear. Norway is something like 98% hydro. So if they've got a lot of water in the, the you know, the, the, the lakes high up in Norway, that's, that's going to really, if it's been a rainy year, that's going to really influence their prices. If fossil fuel prices are very high, you know, we still have, and, and in that period, had um, quite, quite a lot of, well, quite, quite a fossil fuel dominated energy system. So if oil prices are high and consequently gas prices are high, and likewise coal prices, then... Um, Cost to consumers, unfortunately, are going to be higher in, in GB as well. So I'm not sure that these differences really reflect much in terms of the, the transmission charging regime, um, particularly given the size that that is of, of consumers end built. Not to say that it's not important, but it's probably not the key thing driving these, these kind of differences. Okay. Okay, I've got uh, two, two more members who want to come in on, on transmission charging, and then we do need to try and cover some other ground. So I'll start off with Dennis Robertson. Uh, Thank you very much, convener. I, I, I really, just want to. Um, <clears throat> it was actually Ofgem themselves that uh, raised the uh, concerns about security of supply back in 2009, uh, and with that, um, obviously looking at the energy mix that was available at the time and the energy mix that potentially could a, uh, be utilised in terms of resources, and those resources, if we look at Scotland, is both onshore onshore and offshore wind. Um, but Ofgem doesn't seem to uh, move in that direction in terms of ensuring that uh, these projects can go ahead. And part of that is because of the uh, connection charges. And uh, you tend to prefer, say, a the uh, connection, say, between Norway uh, and the UK, rather than perhaps looking inward and actually having uh, a security of networks, say, from the Western Isles. I mean, 
should we not be looking at inward investment in terms of security of supply in the fact that uh, we don't know what's going to happen within the EU eventually? Um, so you raised a number of points within that. One is, I suppose, uh, the support for offshore and onshore wind and, and different technologies. And the second part of that is what, what is the role of transmission charges in relation to that. And then you talked about interconnectors. Why, why are we seeing projects coming forward on interconnectors? UK, UK the governments that determine the policy. And yeah. obviously you're independent of that. So. Yeah, yeah. So you, you anticipated what the first part of my answer was going to be, um, which is that in in terms of um, uh, deciding the appropriate support mechanisms and taxes for different types of energy, that is very much the role for government. Um, that's what they do through, the, CF, through the, um, the EMR policy, the energy market reform policy. They've got CFDs to support renewables. They've got different pots for different types of technology. They've got the capacity um, market in place to support peaking plant. Um, so that, that is very much... These key decisions are decisions set by government. What... The charging, given these decisions, and these are the decisions that really um, drive what our energy mix is, mix is going to be, what, the role of transmission charging in all of that is that given government policy what, that determines the energy mix, how can we keep, charge, how can we keep pos, um, costs down for consumers? And having a cost-reflective charging regime does that. I don't think it's right to use yet another policy instrument to, to tinker, to support things, because government clearly has the tools to do that through the, the energy market reform programme. Mm. Can I get on to your, your question about interconnectors and, and, the, Western, and, and well, the Western Isles or connections to Scottish islands, probably more, more gener generally? So there are a number of projects, um, and we are working very closely um, with, with SSE Transmission on this, proposed to connect um, uh, the Western Isles um, and also Shetland to the transmission network. Um, we've had, uh, we've had the, the Scottish Islands Delivery Forum, which is set up by Fergus Ewing. Um, we've discussed the progress of these, these projects, agreed plans for how we make sure they progress in a timely manner. And we've been working very closely with, with SSE to make sure that, that you know, the, these links do come on when they're needed. Now, the, the critical thing here, and I come back to government policy, is that the thing that's really going to determine whether wind farms get built is the support mechanism um, fr from the government. So, for example, with Scottish Islands, the first decision we need is a decision on the, the CFD levels, the support levels that these wind farms are going to get before we can, you know, either SSE or we can go ahead and say, yes, there should be a link to, to these islands. Um, there absolutely should be a link if the generation is coming on and that link is needed. But, but again, this is back to the costs to consumers. The transmission network it's expensive business. The, the costs, you know, the cost estimates to the Western Isles, I think it's about 800 million. We just approved um, SSE's investment for the, the Caithness Murray link, which was just over a billion. These are, these are big investments, um, and we need to make sure that th the generation at the end of that is, is coming on before companies start paying a lot of money in relation to that. Long-term benefits, are we not? Sorry? We are looking at a long-term benefit uh, uh, in absolutely. terms of security. Uh, um, Yes, so security. So that actually that brings it on to the, the second part of your, your question, which is really about how do we ensure security of supply and, and National Grid and others may want to come in to this. So, so one of the ways in which you ensure security of supply is by having a diverse energy mix. Because if you have a shock in one area, if you have an oil price shock or if the wind isn't blowing, you've got other sources on which to draw on. So you can do that in terms of the, the energy mix you have domestically. Another way in which we do it, and we do this in so many other markets, in fact, almost all other markets, is by trading with other countries. So that if a shock happens in our country, if the wind isn't blowing as much in our country, we can get imports from, from other countries. And you... Needing that demand themselves. Yep, yep. Uh, that's a, and that's a, that's a very, very valid point. I think in in energy, um, in electricity, as with any as with with many other goods, we are connecting with really quite diverse and different markets. So when I talked about the fact that France has is, is primarily nuclear, um, Norway is is hydro. Um, Denmark is, is, is wind, but <laughs> the wind bat patterns are a bit are a bit different from from they are here. What these, in, these interconnectors do are they connect us to 
markets with different energy mixes and the probability that um, there are going to be shortages or things are going to be tight in our market at the same time there is much lower um, and they do contribute to, to security of supply and that's reflected both in terms of the support they, they may get through um, participating in the, in, in the capacity market um, and in our assessment on interconnectors. I, I wouldn't mind saying a couple of more things on interconnectors but if you want to move... Yeah, I, just wonder, I just wonder first before maybe Mike comes in, I, I, just, I, I wondered is it feasible that the uh, UK, GB, could be totally a um, su supply demand, basically? They, they, they don't rely on any other connectors with these within Europe. So that we could actually produce the energy we require when we need it at all times. Is that feasible? I think I might, might bring Mike in on this. I mean, it's clearly feasible, but as Kirsty says, in virtually every other commodity, that will be seen as you're spending more than you, than, than you need to. There is a clear benefit from interconnection and being a trade between countries, as 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 for the reasons that Kirsty's outlined, different different um, generation mixes. I mean, it's worth noting that even the time at which we actually see peak demands is different in our in our on 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 the GB network to what happens in on the Central European network. So even that, you know, gives the the you know reduces the chance we'll have simultaneous peaks and we'll all have a problem at the same time. So there are real opportunities. We you know we do see security supply benefits from interconnection. But I think probably I do. In, interconnection is primarily about the economic benefits of efficiently sharing and trading resources. Um, when we're planning on this, planning the system, we do take into account that we we generally do um, see imports to GB over peak, or we have in recent years. Though we do tend to then export to Ireland, um, and we try to make sort of sensible assumptions around that. Um, if you go back and you look at some, some of the work that the panel of technical experts that was appointed to independently review our assumptions for the government's EMR programme, they criticised us for being a bit too prudent, they thought, and that they thought we could be a bit more sort of optimistic about the ability to import um, from other countries at peak. So we, we try to take you know, prudent, sensible assumptions around that, but recognise there is a benefit from connecting to other countries. So you, know, you can make us fully self-sufficient, but it would come at a price. So. Should we be a net exporter at the end of the day? As opposed to, yeah. I think it all depends on the generation mix and relative economics. When the wind, assuming that we continue with the big build out of low carbon generation and wind, when the wind is blowing across across GB and maybe it's less windy and less sunny in other parts of Europe, we will be exporting. At other points of when we have the big high pressure system. We need to create that wind in the first place and that needs to be connected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just maybe, Kirsty, if, if I may convene her. The... Um, there is a criticism levelled at Ofgem, and I'm sure you're not surprised about that. Um, <laughs> uh, but the criticism is that you don't actually have the the expertise to make some of the decisions that you are making yeah. in terms of the uh, your engineer sort of engineering capacity and all the rest of it. That's a criticism um, that's been levelled at Ofgem that you don't actually have the the necessary expertise within Ofgem to make some of the decisions you're making. How would you respond to that? Yeah, so, so we make we have to draw on a range of evidence and a range of skills to make the kind of decisions that, that we make. Um, many of them are around engineering, so the technical capacity on the system. Um, many of them are around, around the economics. And we have a number of very, very good engineers in Ofgem. Um, we are currently looking to, to recruit more engineers. Um, so we do have a lot of excellent in-house engineering expertise. In addition... Um, because the, the nature of the work we do can be a bit lumpy. So, for example, when we're assessing, <laughs> when we're, we're assessing transmission projects, large transmission projects like Keith and S. Murray, it doesn't make sense for us, um, sort of efficiently as an organisation, to have a lot of a lot of engineers. We have a core set of engineers um, who, who are very expert and have worked in the industry for for many many years. Um, at least over 20 years in the, in the case of some of them. So we will hire in consultants, and again, good consultants, to help us assess the kind of proposals that, um, that are being put forward to us. In addition, there's um, the system operator. So, so Mike, a lot of what he does is electrical engineering. It's about how the system functions and you know, you know, what happens if the, if the voltage is, is, is low. Um, I'm not an expert on, on that, but we have incentives on the system operator to make sure that they, they 
do their job right and take the right decisions. So it's a combination of having in-house expertise in a core with a core set of engineers, plus having incentives on the, the companies that we regulate and using consultants where that's appropriate, that makes us comfortable that we do, do have the, li the right level of expertise. Mm, okay. And finally, um, you are independent. But how, uh, that, with regard to that uh, independence that you have, how influenced are you by the charming Mike Calview and, uh, and <laughs> uh, in terms of, of moving forward? I mean, does he determine, does he help you on your way to make these decisions? I'm actually just saying, are you really independent or are you working so close with, uh, uh, with Mike that there is little independence in your decision making? Okay. So I'm not going to comment on the charmingness or, or otherwise of Mike, as <laughs> <laughs> much as you would, would maybe like me to. But are we independent? Um, absolutely, we're, we're independent. Um, we, we, we regulate the company. We have to be independent of the companies we, we regulate, both the system operator um, and the transmission companies. Um, I, I suppose I, I, I worry about that kind of question. Um, and I suppose I would ask, you know, what, what, what is the evidence for our lack of I, independence? I'm, I'm not seeing it's evidence. Yeah, okay. There's a yep, perception, yep. and I'm asking you to, to sort of, you know, maybe uh, try and uh, answer the question in terms of the perception, how do you actually get away from that? If there's a perception there, obviously you need to try and address that. Yeah, yeah. I think we are, we, we try to be as transparent as we can in our own analysis and in terms of how we, we assess the, the company. So for example, um, in the past we have um, provided our own commentary on security of supply analysis, which National Grid also does um, as a system operator. So, and we have not always agreed. I think it's not a bad thing to have um, several voices, maybe not too many, um, on, on security of supply issues. Um, I, th I think that's an example where you know, we, we, we try to make clear that we are independent of the system operator. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Lamont. Um, thanks very much. Um, it will not surprise anybody to hear that I'm quite in favour of pooling and sharing resources across um, the United Kingdom and the characterisation of Scotland stopping south of the border's lights going out, we would find probably, if it was in reverse, it probably wouldn't be something we'd like to characterise either, when, particularly when we're talking about security of supply. So I, I'm interested in the way your you, the costs um, are worked, because you know there's a logic to seeing we get you know the cost down as much as possible, it's as rational, as logical as possible. That would be okay if all power was the same as all other power and there weren't any other policy pressures. So how can you create an incentive around a movement to renewables, which help our climate change targets, if you simply have a view of all power is the same? How, because that, that, doesn't, that seems to me to be a contradiction, although you do talk about supporting um, renewables, but if you're pricing them out through transmission charges, it's too much to, to actually create one of these projects, then you're making a choice in another direction, aren't you? Is that to me? Or should I mm. start off? Um, so, so again, I, I, think, I think part of the answer to that is around, so, so again, it's gov government will set the, the target. So government will determine the energy mix and what how much it thinks should be on the system in terms of renewables and otherwise in order to, make, to meet the climate change and environmental targets that the government wants. Government also sets um, a security standard. It says we want the system to be this reliable, i.e. effectively as, as secure as it can be. Um, and it, it asks National Grid to undertake analysis to, to look at security of supply. And they do that through a range of publications. So, for example, the future energy scenarios, which are going to be published in July this year. Um, there is a, a session looking at more, the, the more short term, so the winter, the winter outlook, so what's the outlook for security of supply um, over the winter. Likewise, there's now a summer outlook um, session, I believe. So, so government sets policy around the energy mix, but it also sets a security of supply target to make, to make sure that given that policy on the energy mix, um, we can still meet security of, 
of supply objectives, the government security of supply objectives, and it has obligations on, on national grid to, to monitor that. I, I don't know if that was your it's question. Have obligations too around climate change targets. Absolutely. And if you've got a pricing regime that prevents you maximising the renewable opportunities, that must be... I mean, is, is that not a matter for, for you? Is it simply a matter for government to recognise that? I, th I think we come back to what, what, are the, what are the appropriate tools that different parties can use. So, so government has... Government is the, is the, the body that manages the, what we refer to a trilemma, the balance between security of supply meeting environmental targets while at the same time keeping bills as low as possible for consumers. And through the, um, the EMR, the um, Electricity Market Reform Programme, so the CFD mechanisms, we've talked about the carbon tax um, and the, the capacity assessment, it's put in place incentives to generators which will facilitate the kind of energy mix that they want, but at the same time they keep a very close eye on, on security of supply. The charging regime, the, m most people do not think that the charging regime is a tool that effectively incentivizes that. You incentivize that using one tool, i.e. support for generators, and then once you've done that, the charge, you use the charging regime to deliver the energy system that delivers these targets, but at the lowest possible cost. And that's why we have a cost-reflective uh, charging regime. I, I don't know that quite answered your question? No, I think that the dilemma is this is not something that's just simply how do we manage to... What's, what you seem to be saying, this is about the best deal for the customer and who's going to deny that? However, if you're creating, as I've said, a situation where it makes it less likely that, that, that you're bringing on renewable energy, then there's a bigger policy issue. But that's yeah. presumably I, what you're I saying think is that's that beyond for... um, the regulator, it's simply about... I, th decision I, I the think that's right, and that's where the government uses the, the CFD mechanism. It will determine how much, what, what level of support it gives to renewable generators, and that is how it, that is the main lever the government has for determining how much plant comes on. And they are, you know, the government when they set that are fully aware that we have a, a cost reflective charging regime, and they support the fact that we have a cost reflective charging regime. But they will use the, the contract for difference or the sort of guaranteed price for renewable energy to incentivize um, the. the uh, the wind that they want on the system, be that onshore or offshore, and, and other forms of renewable energy. Um, John McCoppin. Yeah, it falls on quite neatly from that. Um, in terms of pumped storage, and if you were designing a system uh, that maximises Scotland's advantage in onshore wind, uh, you, and to the benefit of the rest of the UK as well, and to meet our climate change targets, you would invest in uh, pump storage to even out the intermittencies um, uh, in onshore wind. Now, both SSE and uh, Scottish Power have schemes that are ready to go, uh, but if you, uh, SSE have told this committee, and it says on their website that um, their, their scheme uh, can't go ahead, because of the existing transmission charging regime for pumped storage. And I'd like to know how that can possibly be justified, because clearly it means that we're wasting a lot of our renewable energy in terms of the winds that we could store. So I think, yeah, storage is clearly has a lot of um, advantages in a, in a system that's getting increasingly um, intermittent. Um, but... Yeah, there are a number of different technologies. Pump storage is maybe the traditional tried and tested technology, but there are a number of new technologies being talked about. And clearly, you'd have seen the recent announcement about the sort of you know distributed home Tesla storage. So I think you know at at, at the moment it's probably a issue for the market to develop the most efficient form of storage. I believe that between the mechanisms that Kirsty was outlining, the capacity mechanism, the energy market, there are the mechanisms to incentivise investment in storage if and when it's economic and needed on, 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 on the system. Um, and I think increasingly there will be a need for that and hopefully, you know, but, but at the moment storage is probably just a bit too expensive. Um, 
Kirsty mentioned our future energy scenarios. We'll be publishing that in July. One of the things we're doing is a specific case study around storage because it is one of the big sort of debates for the industry about, you know, when and if do we see large scale deployment of additional storage. And we've what we're, we're trying to do is sort of almost say, well, these are the things that you would expect to see. These are the price signals. These are the sort of technology leaps you might see in terms of making it more economic before you might expect to see a real sort of large scale rollout. But the fact is, storage effectively, you know, is 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 one option amongst the number that might help in terms of managing intermittency, providing peak power when the wind isn't blowing. Uh, a really active demand side is another, you know, and effectively, uh, you know, so you know, rather than sort of almost taking bets on particular technologies. Uh, I think the the view of government and off German, certainly myself, is the best thing to do is find the right economic signals and then effectively let the market come up with the best ways of doing it. Um, I interrupt there, sorry. Yeah. I mean, the market, I mean, the SSE, uh, SSE and, and others are, are, are not happy with the way things are going. And you're talking about, you know, new forms of storage and that that's fine. I'm all for that. But let's look at what you call the tried and tested uh, pump storage uh, that we have at the moment in Scotland. They say that they need a satisfactory and supportive long-term public policy and regulatory framework. When are they going to get that? So, so shall I come in on that? My, my, my starting point is is that storage is is part of... I mean, one of the things we need in an energy system is is flexibility, particularly when we have a system where you've got intermittent wind. And, and I welcome the fact that the committee is looking at that, it's looking at demand side response and it's looking at flexibility alongside security of supply because it is really important. And storage, um, you know, be the pump storage or other forms of storage is is an important part of that and in the future is, is you know, is likely to be um, an increasingly important part of that. Um, what you need to incentivize more storage to come on so different different forms of flexible generation and uh, say storage as part of this will have different costs um, so the government has put in place the capacity market to um, uh, to incentivize energy that that only sort of well will provide energy when the, when the wind is not blowing so that's where the peaking plant comes in and I think I think pump storage can also um, participate in that one of the things we've done is we have sharpened the prices in the, the energy market. So the energy market, um, there's the, the balancing market happens just half an hour before the real time when the, the energy is actually delivered. And it's a market that's managed a bit by, by National Grid as a system operator. And one of the things we've done is we've sharpened the prices in that market because that means, and that is the kind of market that facilities such as pump storage is likely to bid into um, because they, they will now get higher prices if they bid into that market. So we are doing things to to sharpen the signals for flexible generation. That said, different types of, of flexible generation support does come at different costs. And I, do, I don't know um, the details about um, you know, SSE's costs, but, but I think I come back to the point that you want to create an energy system that provides security of supply at the lowest level of cost to consumers and, and currently, you know, some of the storage proposals talked about given current costs for storage will not do that compared to other... Um, OK, well, you're talking about costs. Um, the government, uh, the UK government, is planning to subsidise a new nuclear power station in, sub in, in Somerset at a cost of £50 billion. Um, That's I think it's something like four times the amount of subsidy that's been given to onshore wind so far. That's a political decision. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that you know, like you're integrating into your... Um, that's going to happen. Um, but the consumers are paying the cost for that. Um, investing in pump storage would cost a great deal less. So for you to suggest that this is all about delivering a good deal for the consumer is misleading because you are actually following a political policy lead set by the UK government, which is pro-nuclear. So, so you're, you're absolutely right that it is a political decision, uh, but that's that's government's decision. It's, it's government's decision um, as to whether it supports nuclear, the extent to which it supports other forms of generation. So we've talked about renewables through wind and whether it provides support in terms of research and development to, to storage or, or other financial mechanisms to, to support storage. And that is, that is absolutely... Um, 
that is what government decides. It decides. Yeah, so the government has decided to to, to subsidise nuclear ahead of pump storage. Yeah. yeah. But what what we don't want to do with transmission charging <clears throat> is drive things in a different way to the government in terms of the energy mix. That that is not our role. The government sets policy that determines the energy mix. We as a regulator, and we are slightly boring technocrats, make sure that we can deliver the system in the, the, at, at the lowest cost to consumers. And, and having, I mean, this is going back to transmission charges again, having cost-reflective transmission charges does that given what the government has decided in terms of how it supports different forms of technology? Yeah, just want to add a couple of things. Um, Obviously, pump storage doesn't in itself, it can facilitate wind energy and other intermittent generation, but it doesn't in itself produce green energy, so that is a difference. Um, and obviously, all storage technologies that I'm aware of will have an efficiency in terms of cycle efficiency. So typically, pump storage will be about 80-85% efficiency. So given that some, sometimes they'll be pumping uh, you know, when it's not pure uh, renewable, you know, renewables, it's uh, fossil fuel generation, and, 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 there, and then there'll be efficiency. So pump storage at the moment, net, will actually you know, not be a completely green technology even though I do agree with you. But the other point I want to make, and I think, you know, that I think going forward, there will be an increasing role for storage. I heard some of the previous uh, witnesses talking about you do really need to think about energy storage holistically on the system. It's not just about pure electricity storage. You know, and I absolutely agree with that. If you look at the current system, actually, from an energy storage perspective, the largest energy storage in the system are piles of coal outside power stations. That, you know, and the second largest is very large stored gas in, in, in gas storage facilities. Obviously, we're losing those piles of coal in the sort of 20, in sort of 2020, mid 20s sort of time period. So, at a holistic system level, you do need more storage, I believe, to replace the fact that we are losing a big source of energy storage. Now, whether that's pump storage, whether that's distributed storage in the home, the heat storage type things that we're being talked about, you know, again, I, I, that's a really interesting and very complicated problem that I don't think any single person is ever going to come up with an optimal solution. So, the best thing to do is try to let, you know, get the market signals right and I think you can debate are they completely right and then let the market come up with the right solutions I think you will see more storage deployed particularly in a sort of 10 to 20 year horizon but whether that will be pump storage or Teslas or some other new technology um, you know I think it's a very interesting question All right, I um, need to move on and bring in Lewis MacDonald Thank you very much and uh, I, mean, I don't want to miss the opportunity with uh, the transmission companies all here to ask about actually the transmission network. Um, and and I, th I, I guess the, the Ofgem paper highlights 2.9 billion of investment in Bewley Denny and the West Coast Interconnected and so on, and 2.5 2 billion of potential investment in the islands and, 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 and the Murray Firth link and so on. I wonder if, from all of the witnesses, whether they feel that the way in which these these big infrastructure decisions are made currently uh, is 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 effective and efficient. Uh, is it the right uh, mix of market and direction, and is it the right bodies which are influencing that? Because clearly, talking of very large investments, but very critical to connecting new generation, um, are we doing this in the right way? Uh, are there things that could be improved either from the point of view of the Scottish-based transmission companies or from the point of view of National Grid or, or of Jim? I'll have a go at starting on that. I think, you know, from the point of uh, she transmission, we've invested what, just about £1.5 billion pounds over the last four years. Kirsty mentioned earlier on about, um, you know, there was a, a challenge on uh, their engineering resource with an off-gem. You know, at the end of the day, we've 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 sought we've sought approval and, and agreed agreed um, we've achieved approval of you know two and a half billion just under two and a half billion pounds worth of projects, which includes the Bewley Denny, includes the Kintyre Hunterston, which they've just started uh, putting the subsea cables down today, uh, and it includes you know the Bewley Black Hillocks and the Bewley Dune Rays. You know, some of these projects are completed. Uh, and, and of course Bewley Denny and you know these um, four or five projects will be completed during the course of this year. So you know fr from I think from our perspective, you know it's a big spend. It's happened. We've got Caithness Murray, which uh, you know they're manufacturing cable now. They're on the ground. Another one point two billion pounds. So the, the the process, although you know can be frustrating at times, is pushing on. 
uh, you know, we're delivering the assets and, you know, for the likes of She Transmission, which, you know, five, six years ago or seven years ago, we had an asset value of on the order of kind of 300 million and we're pushing on and, and, you know, within three or four years, we're going to have an asset value of 3 billion. So quite a substantial increase. But that's an asset value in increase, uh, you know, without, um, you know, without uh, the likes of the Shetland or the Western Isles uh, projects, you know, yeah, yeah, added to that. So, you know, these are clearly two of the projects we're, we're hunting at the moment, or hunting or trying to achieve uh, and get close out at the moment. But as well as that, there's quite a number of onshore uh, onshore uh, radial circuits. You know, there's, there's a, quite a few hundred million pounds worth of projects that at the moment it would be potentially difficult to justify for ourselves to demonstrate to off-gem efficient expenditure. So some of these things are the likes of the Bewley to Martins, or it might be the likes of the um, you know, the kind of Tainalt to, you know, Crusade, these kind of projects. So there's, so I, I, I sort of think that it's not so much uh, the process that we've got here with regards to working, you know, with SEC's relationship, you know, with Scottish Power, uh, with National Grid and Ofgem. It's, it's, it's a challenging process, and that's right. Uh, I think the main, the main, the key, the key challenge is really to do with the kind of the, you know, the, the CFDs, and the, which are kind of fe effectively feeding into that, and it's having better clarity in that. So that, I think that's that's the area from the point of view of SSE that, you know, to, to push these projects that we need. And from the point of view of the projects you've described, that are the ones that achieve this this connectivity within the north of Scotland area, and from there uh, more widely. Uh, are, are, is is your company the driver of those investments? In other words, you're making the investments. Is, is is the initiative? Does the initiative lie with you, or does it lie with the regulators or with government policy? The way that this works is that uh, you know the the developers or the generators come. They they ask for a connection offer. They come through uh, National Grid. National Grid can pass that on. We look to see what we can do. We have to you know give them the the least cost option. Uh, so that will give the sort of local connection to the grid. Then we have to kind of work out with all these people that have applied if we need greater infrastructure improvement, i.e. the likes of Bewley Denny. And then it's up to us, uh, you know, in the present, presently, before the likes of some of the ITPR enhanced SO in, um, uh, um, pr pr process you know, being introduced, it's up to us then to, with regards to the big uh, infrastructure projects, then we put forward proposals uh, to Ofgem and why we believe that we have value for money for the customers, and that we aren't going to end up with assets that end up being stranded, stranded because the developers then mm -hmm. don't develop projects because they don't have the appropriate, you know, CFDs or rocks or whatever for the, to support the projects. Yeah. What what I would like to say, just to go back to the question that was asked, um, are we are we happy with the way these decisions are being made? Uh, in that context, I'd, I'd like to bring out a couple of points that the, over the next 10 years, the, the energy, electrical energy position is going to change dramatically. That's been referred to earlier. Um, we have some certainties, and in that 10-year window, we'll be looking at losing the conventional generation. We'll be looking at losing the nuclear generation. Uh, the other thing that's fairly certain is we'll see a rise in the, the renewable contribution. The area that's most concerning from a transmission and distribution network point of view is to understand the level of take-up and the direction that the government's policy will drive for decarbonisation, particularly the diversion of energy from uh, fossil onto electricity for home heating and other purposes, also the change in transport. The existing network is capable of supporting um, small and incremental changes in load over a short period of time. But if a large change of load is coming in over a 10-year time frame, then that 10-year time frame also is consistent with the time it takes to develop the large-scale infrastructure, whether it's a power station or a, a major transmission uh, connection. So we, we are looking at the moment of having to make some decisions that some of the options would be taking 10 years to build when the uncertainty around the take-up of additional electrical loads and demands. Now, wh while the, uh, the importance of demand-side management and absolute uh, reduction in, in, the, in the consumption of, of electricity from an efficiency point of view, while that, that will, will happen, what may not happen is the load 
that the network has to serve will fall because of these additional loads that will be added through these other policies. So trying to forecast and foresee just how much capacity is going to be required in 10 years is a bit of a tricky subject at the moment. So more certainty in medium term policy in these areas would help us to, to decide how, how to satisfy that. Mechanisms. I appreciate the point. We'd all like more certainty, I guess, looking forward 10 years. Are the mechanisms in place that can help to do that? that was... In terms of the future energy scenarios that Mike referred to earlier, yes, there are mechanisms there that we can, as an industry, agree what we want to achieve to meet the demand that is forecast or foreseen as a take-up of government policy. What, what we can't do is, is build a 10-year project that gets us to a place that government policy has moved inside that 10-year time frame. So we need to be very, very careful about what it is we're being asked to provide capacity for. I think if I can just add to that, um, we have a, you know, how they've described it for sort of local connection is absolutely right. The challenge are these big, what we call sort of wider work projects, um, where they do tend to be sort of, you know, big impacts on the system driven by the net impact of an awful lot of individual smaller decisions sometimes. Um, and we have this real challenge that generally investing in new transmission tends to take four to eight years, depending on how, you know, whether it's a new overhead line with planning consent and all of those issues. And sometimes the generation is changing a lot quicker than that. Certainly with wind, we've seen probably wind can come on in a shorter time scale. We're seeing with solar PV, probably coming on more further south than this, but we are starting to see some up in Scotland, can come on in, you know, less than a year if, you know, from sort of virtually nothing to a, to a connected project. So Eric's absolutely right. We are then slightly at the mercy of government policy shifting in timescales sort of shorter than we can respond to. We have got mechanisms to deal with it. We do the scenarios in the future. And what we'll be uh, systematising under the ITPR project, which Dave um, referred to, is effectively across the whole of Great Britain doing rigorous planning of against all the future scenarios that we think is, could, could happen, what is needed, and then using that to inform decisions around what projects should we take forward, where do we need to start doing pre-construction engineering, and when to actually take projects to off-gen for approval for the overall to actually take them forward. Um, and that's quite important because if you're looking at, say, you know, how, when do we start worrying about a scenario about, say, early nuclear closure in Scotland? That's quite a hard decision because it's one that you'll probably always get wrong. You know, it's you know, sort of. So, you know, is is it better to invest early to be on the safe side and then turn out you actually built lots of stuff you didn't really need, or do you, is it better to sort of like leave it and rely on other other solutions coming along, which might be quite expensive? Th those are not straightforward solutions. We are trying to put the mechanism in place to deal with it. In the past, Ofgem has accepted a concept we called anticipatory investment, effectively in, you know, investing before we knew we need it, but in anticipation. Um, and I suspect we'll probably have to continue to use those sort of mechanisms. It, in the past, has been a good mechanism. That's why Western Link has been come forward in a timely manner, because we started it before we really, need, need, need it, before we really knew we needed it. And actually, you know, we did need it, so actually it's going to be beneficial flowing in both ways, um, you know, as, as, again, previously been talked about. Can I come in? Again, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question, because your, your question is really, is the, the regime for planning and delivering uh, these network assets appropriate? And it's, it's a good question, because as we said, um, you know, the, the companies are investing about £7 billion worth in transmission assets over the current price control period, so that eight years between 2013 and 2021. And we, we looked at this as part of the ITPR project, which, which others have referred to. It stands for Integrated Transmission Planning and Regulation. We looked at exactly that question. Um, and our findings were there could be some improvements. And we took our decisions on that earlier this year. Uh, it was spring this year. It's a bit hard to tell the seasons these days, but um, uh, so it was, it was spring this year. Um, and what we decided was that we wanted a stronger role. For, so as, as Mike said, they produced the future energy scenarios, which sets out what generation is, is likely to come on. And then the transmission um, owners look at this, consider developments in their own areas, and they bring forward proposals for transmission build in light of that. 
Importantly, and this is the boring tech, techie part, but very important part, in their licenses, they have the obligation to develop a system that is economic and efficient. And what that means is bringing forward proposals that are built to deliver the energy and for us to assess in, in a timely manner. So they have that obligation on them. The changes we made to the regime for, for planning and delivering the system were, were for, firstly to give the system operator a stronger role in looking at these options and assessing whether these indeed are the best options that the transmission companies come forward with. Are there other another level of scrutiny? You know, are there other other ways in which this can be done more efficiently, both through actually managing the system more efficiently or through build because that's that's some of the trade-offs that the companies need to think really hard about is you know does does it always need lots of big kit like pylon and undergrounding or are there other ways in which we can manage the system more eff effectively so we want the system operator to engage more closely with the transmission companies in doing that so that was that was what we did on the planning side on the delivery side um again we think things can be done better and that's set out in our proposals in particular um, to drive down costs to consumers we think um, there is a role for bringing more competition into building onshore transmission network so what we have said is where there are large new separable transmission projects these can potentially be tendered out and delivered by competitive parties and, and the evidence this is it's, it's a controversial decision um, but we looked very, very carefully at this. We looked at evidence um, from what's happened in the offshore regime here, evidence for other um, from other countries, um, and came to the firm conclusion that this, this can deliver benefits to consumers, not in all projects, not in small, complicated projects that are part of the very mesh networks, but for very big, separable projects. There are benefits in bringing more competition into the market here and, and, and pushing prices down and ultimately consumer bills. And is it too early to know whether that might happen? In other words, whether serious bids might come in from new potential Yep. so we, we are players. looking to move quite quickly on this we're hoping to be in a position to be able to tender it, it requires some changes to legislation um, and, and processes um, but we're hoping to be in a position to potentially tender projects around the, the end of 2016 2017 at the same time what we don't want to do is we don't if there are projects and train that need to be delivered for a certain time when we know there's generation coming on at the end of it we don't want to cause undue delay to these projects but in the longer term we we really think we can drive down um costs to consumers by introducing more competition onshore like we have in interconnectors and like we have in in, in offshore uh, we, need to move on. We, we need to we need to finish the session by 12 30 because we have the minister coming in after us and i've still got members who who are, want to ask questions uh, firstly chick brody Thank you, Convener. Uh, firstly, my apologies for being uh, late this morning. I had a problem with personal transmission from Ayrshire to, to Edinburgh. Um, I have four very brief questions. I'm sure they will be answered briefly. Um, you've just mentioned, uh, I've made the first, first question is from Ms Berger. Um, you've just mentioned that you're looking for competition. Yet in your uh, submission, you say Ofgem regulates the monopoly companies that own and operate the transmission and distribution uh, networks. I think earlier on you talked about the the basic costs, which I think are a bit fanciful, because there are other costs associated with companies running uh, uh, the, the transmission network and what have you. So just very briefly, can you tell me, how do you regulate these companies? What do you actually look at? So we, uh, with the transmission companies, uh, they bring forward proposals f for us. Um, to say we need we need a transmission network for we need a transmission link for example in Caithness Murray so so what we do is we look at their case for is there really a need for this and um, we look at is do we expect transmission to come on in this area and therefore is there need for a substantial reinforcement for that so that's the first point is it needed and um, the second thing we do is we look at the cost of that of the investment that come forward because they are monopoly <coughs> companies and it's it's not like in a competitive market where you can sort of observe the price by different companies competing against each other that's what we do as when we regulate um, so for example in that case um, we looked at we said yes there, there is a need there's clearly a lot of generation coming forward um, in the north of Scotland that needs to be trans transmitted to the the demand centers further south um, th there there is a need and then we looked very, very carefully at the cost for that project. As we've mentioned before, it is um, 
about a billion pounds, it's going to cost about a billion pounds to build this project. Um, we uh, reduced, uh, SSA come to us with a proposal for the cost of that. We made quite significant reductions to the cost that they um, put forward to us. And that goes straight on to a re into a reduction in consumers' bills. So that's that's how we regulate them. Well, you, you say it goes on. But we've had investment in the past which hasn't result, resulted in reduction in consumer bills. Uh, and... and you know, I would contest that, and, and you know, if I look at mon mon monopoly companies, I look at much more than just, you know, what is this investment. I look at the companies themselves, and apart from the management, all the other elements of cost. So, if I may, just then on that basis, uh, ask Mr. Calvio, who are the Barclay Group? Sorry, who are the Barclay Group? Uh. They, I'm not particularly familiar with them, but I, I suspect they are a financial um, player who works in capital markets. So you, you're not aware that, they, that you have a joint venture with them and that uh, you are dealing in property in up to four, 24 sites? This is from your, your report uh, at Coventry's House. So, so, no, so, so if you're talking about... So, 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 so National Grid property is a completely different part of National Grid than the one I work in. Um, but we we do property development. We have a number of sites that used to, particularly uh, in England, uh, in England, um, have disused gas holders in, and we are re and we are experts, effectively, at redeveloping uh, land, doing the environmental clean up, and uh, releasing it in order to provide well, housing. I think that's all very worthy. For, forgive me for interrupting, because I know we have a shortage of time. But the, again, in, in, your in your report, financial report, half year report, it talks about realising greater value for London, for our London portfolio. I mean, how much time are you spending on transmission, which is your core business as far as we're concerned, and investing elsewhere? And it comes back to the issue that you're not looking at all the costs involved in, in monopolies at all. Well, just to be clear, I spend 100% of my time on transmission. That's my business. Uh, the people in National Grid PLC who deal with that are completely different part of the business and uh, ap apply the appropriate resources. We, you know, we are a large corporate um, uh, company with many parts of the business, and we make sure we have the appropriate resources. But you know, we are, uh, you know, we absolutely take resourcing our, our our activities extremely seriously. I'm I'm actually recruiting massively at the moment due to some of the. Uh, enhanced responsibility that Kirsty is talking about. We need more power system engineers, um, and we've been investing, um, you know, uh, about a billion and a half per annum every year for the past probably five years on the on the on the transmission we, network. You can understand my concern as to who's paying for this or paying for a part of it. Certainly, when we talk about getting the bills down, which are not coming well, down, and you're investing in non-core business. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just um, saying. The, yeah. ed, any investments in non-core business outside the transmission business would only have done on the basis they pay for themselves. Anything that wouldn't touch consumer bills. The, the amount we're investing in the transmission network is in order to provide the ability to move power from where it's being generated, such as in Scotland, down to consumers in other parts of the network. So, uh, And we're regulated by um, Ofgem, as, as Kirsty has described. OK, I wonder, I wrote this down, I mean, you said, it, you said coming back to, to uh, investment and generation, you said we can't get generation in the time scales we need to. Is that true? Or was that a mistake? No. no. I, I, I said generation can come often, often come in on a shorter time scale than we can necessarily build the transmission that that, that generation sort of um, uh, would ideally uh, be in place. We've had to put in a number of mechanisms to deal, to deal with that. You know, I don't buy generation. I do sometimes contract with generators around specific balancing services. Um, but ultimately, it's for the energy market to develop generation. And just one, one last question. Briefly. For, for, for uh, Ms. Berger, Mr. Levy and Mr. Garner. Is the National Grid the right body to uh, act as our systems operator? I could take that one, yes. The, um, <laughs> the organisation that, that Mike is responsible for as a system operator, that... Um, that has come quite different functions from the organisation which is also inside National Grid, which is to own transmission assets. So they're, although they're under the same umbrella, they do actually operate two, two separate functions. So we, we relate quite closely with, 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 with Mike and his team about connections to the system uh, and how reinforcements need to be planned to meet the needs. But we also relate to the 
other side of the, the business, the owning side, uh, in terms of the physical connections and how we how we arrange our physical activities on the ground. But someone's got to be the UK system operator. Someone's got to hold the ring. So the only question would be whether there's sufficient independence between the two parts of the business, which one of which is overseeing the, the national interest and the other effectively in competition with ourselves. Mr Gardner. Yeah, it's very much the same very much the same line as that comment. Um, I think you need a you need a single SO to, to ensure that you get the sort of optimum solutions are de are developed uh, and you know for the running of actually of the system and the development of the system into the future. Right. Very briefly, please, Kirsten. My answer was going to depend on what everybody else's was, but, but no. <laughs> so my, my answer, that's not quite true. My, my answer is, yes, they are, but it's a good question because you do want to make sure that you've got confidence that um, what they do as the SO is separate from what they do as the, 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 the TO, and I think that's where you were going with your question. So, for example, with the enhanced duties that they have as a system operator following our ITPR project, we have set stronger ring fences about how they can share information, who can take what decisions uh, within the SO uh, to, to, to limit the interaction between the SO and the TO. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, Patrick Harvey, are you still keen to come in? Uh, I think the moment's passed. Can moment's you? passed. Okay. Gordon McDonald, do you want to come in about the capacity uh, margin? No? Right, okay. Well, I find we've got three minutes left. Anybody else wants to come in with a follow up question? Lewis McDonald did, I, yeah. I, I, I yeah. did want to follow yes. up. Yes. Uh, on, on the conversation we had a little earlier about um, transmission uh, uh, operation and the bids that uh, companies might make to construct that because one of the other aspects that's come up in uh, some of the evidence has been around um, other consequences of, of building the necessary transmission connections. Um, for example, around economic development in remote areas, around, uh, if you like, creating the critical mass uh, to enable uh, generation to go forward. And I wonder if witnesses feel that the structure and the system we have at the moment uh, achieves those objectives as well as it could, or whether there needs to be, there ought to be a consideration of other uh, uh, aspects of policy in deciding whether infrastructure projects go forward or not. Hmm. Start with that. Um, so, so we do need to be clear what our role is as a regulator. And much as I might have personal preferences and be very interested in regional economic development, uh, unfortunately for me, that is not my role as a regulator. So, we, our, our duty is to protect the interest of interests of energy consumers. It is not as an employment generating agency. You don't want the energy regulator to be the employment generating agency. You want government to take these policy decisions. So, so government takes decisions as to, you know, what, what the skills policy, what skills and training policies is, what employment support policies is. You know, to some extent, it's constrained by European legislation, what kind of industries you should um, support in what places. Um, and again, what kind of energy mix you, has, you have through the EMR policy. So that, that is not our role as a regulator. Our role is to make sure that the transmission companies deliver a network that delivers the government's objectives and energy um, in, in the most efficient way. And inviting potential competitive tender b uh, bids, you will, sim will you simply go for lowest cost? Will that be the criterion that you will apply? It is, but it has to it has to meet the sort of safety and reliability yes, standards yes, and yes. timeliness. Um, mm. it, it has to score against all these points. It's not just you not know really um, <laughs> uh, quality matters um, as well as cost for the the energy network. Absolutely. Right. I think we're out of time. So um, thank you all very much for coming along um, and helping the committee. Uh, we will now have a short suspension to allow a changeover.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, uh, I'd like to welcome joining us uh, this afternoon uh, Fergus Ewing, Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism, who's joined by uh, Colin Miller, Head of Policy, uh, Claire Anderson, Drafting Solicitor, and Charles Keegan, Head of Land Register Completion at the Scottish Government. And we are here to uh, take evidence on uh, a piece of subordinate legislation, the Registers of Scotland, uh, bracket voluntary registration, comma, amendment of fees, etc. close bracket order 2015 in draft. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. The draft order which the committee is considering today is a significant step in the process towards the completion of the land register, which is one of the key policy objectives underpinning the Land Registration Scotland Act 2012. As the committee knows, the Scottish Government has asked the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland to complete the register by 2024. The main purpose of the draft order is to provide an incentive to increase the uptake of voluntary registration applications, and it seeks to do so in three ways. A, the, first of all, the order provides a 25% reduction in the fee for voluntary registrations across each of the ranges of consideration paid or value, and if Parliament approves the order that fee reduction, that fee reduction would come into force on the 30th of June this year. Second, the draft order provides for the closure of the Register of Saisings to the recording of new standard securities from the 1st of April 2016. The effect of, it, of this is that a person who owns land which is recorded in the Register of Saisings would be required to apply for voluntary registration of the title to the land in the land register so that that standard security can be registered. Where voluntary registration is required to allow the registration of a new security in this way, the draft order removes the fee for voluntary registration altogether. Once again, that provision would come into effect on the 1st of April 2016. Finally, the draft order removes with effect from the 1st of April 2016 the Keeper's current discretion in Section 27.3b of the 212 Act to refuse an application for voluntary registration. Registers of Scotland estimate that these provisions taken together would result in an increase in the number of voluntary registration applications of the order of 5,000 per annum. Over the period 2024, when the register is due to be completed, this would equate to some 5% of the total number of unregistered titles. As I've mentioned, Convener, although the proposed 25% reduction in fee for voluntary registration would come into force on the 30th of June if the order is approved, the remaining provisions relating to the closure of the register of seasons to new securities and the removal of the keeper's discretion to refuse applications for voluntary registration would not come into effect until 1st of April 2016. Following consultation with interested parties, the reason for allowing that relatively long lead-in time is to ensure that mortgage lenders and others have sufficient time to make any necessary changes to their own systems and processes. Registers of Scotland will work closely with all interested parties to make sure that they are aware of the proposed changes and the process of implementing them is as straightforward as possible. Whilst the main purpose of the draft order is to provide incentives to increase the uptake of voluntary registration applications, we have also taken the opportunity to make a number of relatively minor changes to land register fees. First, to provide a disposition for the sole purpose of evacuating a survivorship destination is to be charged at a fee for, of £60 for each title sheet convener affected instead of a value-based fee, which in some cases, uh, as you will know, convener can be prohibitive. Second, the draft order provides that the current fee of £30 where an application is rejected or withdrawn will not apply where the sole reason for rejection or withdrawal is that another related application in respect to the same land or title number has been rejected or withdrawn. And finally, the draft order provides for the keeper to be able to charge a small fee of £16 plus VAT or in one case £30 plus VAT for copies or extracts of documents such as a copy of a search sheet from the Register of Savings. Convener. The main proposal set out in the draft order were included in the consultation on land register completion, which took place between July and November last year, and were finalised after further stakeholder workshops and feedback from business, from the legal profession and from mortgage lenders. I believe that the provisions set out in the draft order will be a significant step forward in the journey towards the completion of the land register, which will be a major national asset for Scotland, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions that members may have. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, do any members have any questions? Patrick Harvey. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm sure we'll all welcome steps towards the completion of the land register. I wonder if the minister could tell us if the increased registration rate that he's anticipated takes place, what level of income from fees will be foregone? Um, well, 25 per cent. Which amounts to what in terms of the, the overall cost that the taxpayer will, will then be paying to administer the register? A well, I think Mr. Keegan can answer that uh, question um, if you if your permission. Yes, Mr. Keegan. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, the first thing to say is that Register of Scotland uh, has its own income from its own fees, so we don't take anything from the taxpayer directly, but through applications. In terms of the um, number of um, st uh, voluntary applications through this process, we would expect it to be around 5,000 a year, which we estimate based on our average fees of around about 1.3 million. Um, which we do. Obviously, that depends on the level, which which comes through is due to market activity and how um, how attractive this 25 percent discount would be to 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 uh, applicants. I mean, I think it would be it's a reasonable point that Mr. Harvey raises. Convener, it'd be reasonable also for me to point out that the the purpose of doing this is to meet the objective of a 224 timetable, which I think is one that Mr. Harvey supports. Um, and in one sense, uh, if we don't do this, then I think many of the 5,000 applications that we anticipate to get may not arrive. In other words, that it may not actually lead to reduced income. It may lead to more applications that won't otherwise come if we don't do this. And therefore, if there are more applications than there would otherwise have been, then you could argue, and you know, time will tell, convener, I, I'm not making a assertion one way or the other, but you could argue that if you have 5,000 more applications that you wouldn't have had, or if you'd only had one or 2,000, although the fee for each is reduced, the global aggregate income may in fact be increased. So, uh, so I, think, I think just having had a moment's reflection to deal with Mr Harvey's uh, question, perfectly reasonable question, I, I should make that point, that it won't necessarily re result in a drop of income to the keeper. It could actually result in an increase in income and certainly a, a policy imperative which I assume Mr Harvey supports. I, I wasn't seeking to argue against this course of action, simply to understand the, the scale of the income from fees that would be foregone compared with a situation where registration is required and fees required to be paid as well. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, any other points? Can I, can I maybe ask just in a similar vein, I mean, if we're going to have an extra 5,000 transactions coming to registers of Scotland, um, I, I wonder, Minister, if you're satisfied that uh, registers of Scotland have the the capability and staff to, to handle that, given that uh, it's quite likely some of these applications for voluntary registration will, will involve what might be quite complex titles, you know, large estates that over the years have sold off little parcels of land um, or historic titles, which perhaps perhaps are not plan based. So you, know, you can see quite a substantial increase in, in workload for Register Scotland staff. Um, are you satisfied that, that there's the, the capability there to, to deal with that increase? Uh, yes, I am. And, uh, you know, I, I have had the, the benefit of uh, working with the Keeper for several years now. I'm absolutely confident that her staff will deal with the work and deal with it extremely professionally. Um, I should say uh, to Claire Anderson has just pointed out to me that had we not uh, uh, made the changes that we are proposing to make in the draft order, then at present the method of dealing with uh, these matters would have been to require a Keeper-induced uh, registration rather than a voluntary one. Were that to have been the case, the status quo to apply, then a keeper-induced registration attracts no fee, uh, and therefore it's necessary to move to the lower fee in order to obviate the situation which would have resulted perhaps in the use of the keeper-induced method to attract uh, more registration onto the register of, of titles perhaps held in trust of the state. So that's a technical point, but I think it's a, one that is correct for me to put on to the, the record. But on your point, convener, I am confident. I think I'm right in saying, although maybe my um, colleagues can help me here, that 5,000 is a, you know, it's a large number, but it's a small number in comparison with the number of annual property transactions a year, which are, I think are in the order of two or 300,000, just from memory, if that's yeah. right. Maybe Mr. Keegan or Mr. Miller can just refresh my memory and uh, your committee. I Yes, we. I mean, currently, I mean, it depends on market activity, but we get between three and four hundred thousand currently um, applications a year. So five thousand would not be um, a, an insuperable num additional number. Just on, on on the point, the first point you made in response to my question, Minister, about about fees, 
if I had a title that, that, that was unregistered and I wanted to submit for voluntary registration, I'd be charged a fee. But if I do nothing and eventually the keeper comes along and induces it, I don't have to pay any fee at all. Why would I not just wait? I think a clear answer is going to be that. <laughs> Please. The, the benefit to a voluntary registration is, is that the solicitor is involved in, in the process and it's more likely that there will then be a grant of the keeper's warranty, which is a particularly good benefit to the title owner. In the case of a keeper and just registration, it's less certain that that warranty would be granted. So, so this is a, a job creation scheme for solicitors. And it's all the more welcome for that, can I say. Uh, well, well, to be serious, I have actually advocated voluntary registration to, uh, you know, the those who, who have uh, substantial land holdings and their representatives. And I did so in 2011 and 2012, actually f for that absolute reason, that in that time, many of the big firms in Scotland were laying off young solicitors. And therefore, I have for a long time advocated that, that uh, landowners in particular can play a part in helping to generate work, which enables us to avoid shedding a, the, the services, particularly of young solicitors, just at a, a most difficult time. I mean, hopefully, economically, we've moved on since then, but I think the argument uh, remains the same. If uh, this is taken up, and I'm confident it will be actually convener, then, then it will help to, I think, secure legal work for young practitioners uh, and give them good experience at the beginning of their uh, career. I expect they will end up doing quite a lot of the hard work, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, Chick Brody? This perhaps is uh, a silly question for uh, the legalities of this, but making a point of trying to get as many people to register as possible, what is going to be the mechanism for communicating this as widely as we possibly can? Well, I think it's already been communicated fairly widely. I mentioned earlier that, uh, um, well, we've had the, the land registration bill, and of course members of this committee have played a, a part in bringing that to fruition. Um, but uh, also the, the Keeper has had meetings with stakeholders. I think I'm right in saying, and I maybe ask uh, Mr. Keegan or Mr. Miller to expand on this, that there has recently been a meeting with 26 solicitors who have clients who are likely to be able to avail themselves of the provisions of uh, this, this uh, instrument, if uh, Charles could... Yes, um, uh, thank you. We've, we've got a number within Register Scotland. We obviously have very good contacts with solicitors and surveying community, so we'll be sending information out electronically to them. Um, we've also, as the Minister said, we've had a number of uh, meetings with key stakeholders and professional advisors, really, of um, particular, particular groups of, 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 of uh, landowners and explaining the benefits of voluntary registration. I have to say, working for the Land Register, it's very encouraging to hear those stakeholders think about actually being on the Land Register as a better thing. Um, and so it's actually quite an encouraging thing. And what we're doing with them is we're working out what, what we could do to help them uh, in the pre-registration world by providing information to them, maybe in different formats from the way that we've done before. So it's quite an encouraging uh, landscape at the moment. Yes, very good. OK, if there are no other questions to the Minister, I would just uh, point out to members that the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument on the 26th of May uh, and there were no points that arose in relation to it. We will now move to item three on the agenda um, and I would ask uh, the Minister to move uh, the motion to approve the Register of Scotland Voluntary Registration Amendment of Fees etc. Order 2015. Minister. So moved. Thank you, Minister. Do any members wish to speak uh, on this uh, motion. Uh, if uh, not, I will put the question. The question is the motion S4M13318B agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Uh, are the members content that the convener and the clerk produce a short factual report of the committee's decision and arrange to have that published? Agreed. Great. Thank you very much. We now move into private session. Thank you.